Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let us start. And thank you all for coming. And I think a few more will come as the day goes on. Uh, but before we start, just the um, normal housekeeping that this uh, meeting is being recorded and it's also being transmitted to YouTube. 
and um, a summary report of the action items will be produced not this week this time but next week early next week and will be published um, if you want to um, have the floor you have your badges you can just um, yes exactly and um, for those of you who are up there can you just wave it a little bit so that I can see it and um, when you when the chair uh, gives you the floor can you just please state your name and your stakeholder group if you're a MAG member or not and um, this is the open consultation day so non-MAG members do have preference and then uh, for tomorrow and the next day MAG members have the preference but this is the open consultation day we have quite a few members online um, <clears throat> as well I uh, we have 45 people online at the moment um, for them to be able to hear us uh, you need to switch on your mics and speak into your mics for you to be able to hear them you need to use your um, thing it doesn't get um, transmitted into the PA system um, also I know some people can speak very fast uh, please speak in a measured um, tone uh, measured pace sorry uh, so that people can hear you and then when you are finished you can um, please make sure that your microphone is off also please make sure that if you're in the Webex room that your laptop is muted so that we don't have any of this feedback loop um, that sometimes happens um, with that let me just check if I have not forgotten to say anything oh yes we have the transcriptions in Webex as well if you want it it's there I know it's very helpful for some people it's where it says um, the CC um, link on the left hand side uh, that's where the transcription is um, with that I will hand it over to our chair Paul Mitchell to start the meeting Thank you. Mm -hmm. good morning can you hear me <clears throat> can you hear me now thank you I uh, really want to extend my appreciation to all of you for putting the time and effort and energy into all the work that you're doing to support the IGF this 19th IGF I'm amazed at the state of technology and how rapidly it continues to change and how rapidly it continues to affect everything we do in our lives from healthcare to engineering to education to all of the disease mitigation efforts everything we do in this world now relies in some level on what we do with the internet and so that means that the work that we do here in this meeting and in all of the other collection of meetings that are happening around the periphery of our deliberations here they are critically important and sometimes we can get mired in our own magnificence and forget just how much work and activity happens outside of this group but in all of the other extended groups and societies and technologists and people with brilliant ideas to share all that work really matters so for this meeting I hope you'll keep that in mind at least in part that that even though it may seem like this is just a another bottom bottom row activity for the UN the reality is this is a top drawer activity this is one that is building our future and so I really hope you keep that in mind as we go through the agenda um, and I don't want to take too much more of, of the time just to 
recommend very much that you take some time with the documents that come out of these meetings. And if you can't feel, spend the time on the whole documents, look for the chair summaries from each of the, the working groups and familiarize yourself with them and make friends with your fellow compatriots in this endeavor. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, pass it over to uh, uh, Ken Kenichi Kawai, um, representing our host country. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to my members and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kenichiro Kawai, an Assistant Director of the Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. On behalf of my boss, oh, you have to speak up. No, no, it's fine. You just have to speak louder. Ah, okay. And uh, slower. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, on behalf mm -hmm. of my boss, uh, uh, my co-chair, Mr. Ida, uh, for regrettably, I have to miss today's opportunity of open consultation and wanted to send his hero to all of you. Uh, I'd like to make a brief uh, statement to explain some updates in our efforts as a host country. Uh, the latest update in the launch of the uh, dedicated website, uh, which has opened on 7th of July uh, last Friday. If you visit the URL in the slide, can I? Uh... Oh, uh, no, this is just. Um, for the rest country, I think the next slide. Okay, okay. This is just that. Yeah. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll talk to you about a detail about the writer. Thank you very much. Um, the video music. And next, we will share a video um, about the. Uh, Preparations. So the next thing is the um, greetings from Under Secretary General of DESA, Mr. Liu. Distinguished delegates, members of the IGF, much stakeholder advisory group. It is a pleasure to address you on behalf of the UN DESA. I also take this opportunity to acknowledge your hard work as you begin your second in-person meeting of the year and continue planning for the 18th IGF. You have put forward a rich agenda for the IGF that reflects the central place of the digital issues in our lives. The eight sub-themes of the program are well aligned with ongoing discussions at the UN headquarters on the Global Digital Compact. They include addressing persistent digital divides, AI's rapid impacts, data governance and trust, and global digital cooperation. We must meet stakeholders' expectations on all those urgent issues. We have a responsibility to ensure that digital transformation is people-centered, equitable, secure, and in line with development aspirations of the global community. Every day we see advances in artificial intelligence and other technologies that are a cause for both hope and concern. With its more than 150 national, regional, and youth IGF initiatives, as well as the specialized expertise embodied in the intersessional activities like policy networks, best practices forum, and the dynamic coalitions. The IGF can bring the meaningful capacity building measures and the recommendations to the table. This is a complex tax that must be carried forward across the world. We know the IGF 2023 agenda is of strong public interest, 
because stakeholders have responded to it in record numbers. And in press of the 800 session proposals were received for the meeting, and the 400 of these were for the workshops, twice the number of the previous years. It will be challenging, but it also rewarding to review these, make the selections, and deliver in a dynamic program. Last year in Ethiopia, we witnessed the high quality discussions that were captured in the Addis Ababa IGF messages. I have no doubt that this year, you will build on that work and design a program that results in the further as actionable and forward-looking messages. As you know, events on the horizon are shaping global digital governance. The ministerial meeting on our common agenda and the SDG summit will both take place in coming September, with the summit of the future to be held in 2024 and the General Assembly reviewed the of the WISIS Plus 20 in 2025. The IGF meeting in Kyoto will be an opportunity to highlight the essential role of the IGF and its multi-stakeholder contributions to those events and their follow-up processes. To the stakeholders here today for the open consultations, I would also like to recognize your tireless commitment to this IGF. The IGF is a space created with and for you. We can only make progress toward the Kyoto with your contributions. At the time of the unprecedented technological acceleration, we need all your voices and expertise to outline a vision for the internet that we want and the world needs. We count on your continued engagement. To the IGF donor community, I want to take this opportunity to thank you. Your contributions allow us to provide effective services to the IGF and its intersessional work and enhance capacity building in developing countries. Thank you all, and I wish you a productive meeting. Thank you very much. So we had <clears throat> some exchanges on uh, the Global Digital Compact. Yeah. Update for the host country preparations is what we'll have now. So I'll turn the floor over to my colleague. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to experience, uh, explain about the, uh, our preparation. Um, the latest update is the launch of the uh, a dedicated website which was opened on 7th on July last Friday. If you visit the URL in the slide, you will see such top page of the site. Uh, can we just display? Is it possible to display the slide? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, uh, detailed, inf detailed information is not uploaded yet, but visa information and accommodation tips will be coming soon. Uh, you can also see the logomark for the annual IZF conference this year in this slide. If you would like to use this logo in your document while you are in activity, please contact with us as, as indicated in the website. With regard to the day zero events, uh, we are now planning around a dozen of sessions and all of them are quite in line with the theme of the sub teams of IZF this year. Uh, probably uh, Chengeta will uh, I'll uh, uh, introduce lately, uh, we'll be setting five high-level sessions across the days. 
uh, as many of uh, you may know, we're running the seven discussion on generative AI as Hiroshima AI process. Uh, we all understand the multi-stakeholder approach is so important. We're thinking of making best use of this opportunity of IZF Kyoto for AI discussion too. Uh, and that is all for me, and thank you very much for your kind attention. We are looking forward to uh, meet in the Kyoto uh, this October. Thank you. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Ken. Just to add, as um, Ken has said, um, first of all, uh, host country website is up. Um, it doesn't have that much information at the moment, but in the following days and weeks, it's going to have all the information um, about the visa application, getting to Kyoto, and getting to, to Kyoto is not that difficult. You can either land in um, Tokyo and take a bullet train, a uh, two-hour bullet train, which is fantastic, uh, to Kyoto, or you can land in Osaka and go to Kyoto, and Kyoto is about, uh, I don't know, not more than an hour away from Osaka. Um, accommodations, you will not be able to get any accommodation right close to the um, venue itself. There is just one hotel next to the venue, and, um, <clears throat> and that hotel has been totally reserved for the VIPs. So if there's people who are, <laughs> if there is people, I'm just gonna carry on. <laughs> if there are people who have got ministers, deputy ministers, etc., who would level, uh, who would want to stay at the hotel, please contact the secretariat and we will forward the names to the, our Japanese hosts and they can reserve that room. But all other people, you can stay within Kyoto Central, that is fine. There is a subway stop right there at the conference center. So transport to the conference center is very, very easy and the trains are even more efficient uh, than the ones in Geneva, so no problem. <laughs> um, so, I, uh, so, you know, there's a whole range of accommodation and, um, I mean, I live in Geneva, so just comparing the prices, they're very, very reasonable. Um, and um, so, yeah, so, so that's that. And as um, Ken was also saying that for our high-level leader session, uh, because it was mentioned, I mean, we'll have a further discussion later, but I'll just let you know that um, we do have five high-level sessions, and um, one is being on um, understanding data-free flow with trust. The second session is evolving trends in mis- and disinformation. The third one being um, looking ahead to WSIS Plus 20, where we would hope to get all the... Um, uh, the heads of the institutions who are leading um, the WSIS Plus 20, that's ITU, UNESCO, um, DESA, and UNCTAD, um, for a discussion, and also uh, from outside of the UN um, community to have an, a, an outside point of view. And then the uh, fourth one is access and innovation for revitalizing the SDGs, and the fifth one is going to be on AI. Uh, so those are the things. Uh, we know that, yes, uh, we have published on our website as well the call for travel support, um, and the deadline for that is the 15th, 12th. Um, so, yeah, so if you haven't, you've got two days. Um, soon. <laughs> um, so, and we are giving preference, of course, to uh, least developed developing countries and transitional economies and those people who have an active participation um, in the meeting that will, you know, contribute to the meeting and also those people that 
uh, from countries that have not yet participated in the IGF or from disadvantaged groups. Um, uh, we have a point system, and um, that's what we are going to use. I do know that there is some anxiety going around um, about visa issues, etc. Uh, we are slightly different from the other meeting where this anxiety is arising from. Um, we do have an agreement with the government. The um, missions, the Japanese missions, are being informed that people are going to come um, for the IGF meeting. So um, everybody's going to be well, um, well versed um, by the time you go to the mission. Of course, yes, there's always at the very beginning um, before the process gets um, kicked off, but um, w we don't foresee any great difficulty as long as you comply with the visa requirements, um, which are s stipulated on the um, uh, consulate websites and also on the host country um, website as well. Um, if you comply uh, with um, all those um, requirements, we don't particularly see any great um, issues at all. But we do have, if there are any issues, you can just contact us and um, we'll see how we can um, deal with those. So with that, the floor. Yes, Amrita. Thank you, Amrita, for the records, MAG member. Um, I ha you know, uh, it's good to hear that, you know, day zero also will have an AI session and even the high level track will. Uh, just so that, uh, you know, the host country is aware, there is a policy network on AI which was established this year. Uh, could there be some synergy between, I know it's a high level track and then you have a day zero, but if uh, you know, the discussions can be a bit synergized between all the AI sessions. Perhaps it may be meaningful. Yes, we will synergize it. Um, but, you know, AI is a broad field. So we'll have to check what's the content um, that you would want and what's our content. Um, I think our content is specifically specifying on the regulatory frameworks. So... Yes, of course, we will make sure that there's no duplication or overlap, but yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll I, I understand every layer has different yeah. aspects, but sometimes even within layers, if there is synchronous discussions, it helps to, you know, pass the message better. Totally understood. Thank you. Yes, Chris. Thanks, Chengitai. Chris Buckridge, uh, MAG member. Uh, it, it was just a very... Brief question. So when you say the fifth high-level leader session, it will be about AI, is that referring to the special session with Maria Ressa and Jacinda Ardern? Is that the AI theme? Oh, no, that's the one that, uh, no, that's a different uh, session. Okay. Yeah. But uh, So I don't see the fifth one on the um, draft? Uh, we're Did still formulating say? it, and okay. it's going to take up some of that slot from the opening session. Um, so it's not going to take up any more space. Okay. Uh, yeah. So right. it's it's in there. Thanks for clarification. Do we have a non-Mag member who has questions? It being open consultation day. Anything? Um, online, I don't see any hand that is up. But I'll take that as a sign that you're all very happy with the preparations and the information at hand. And thank you. If you do think of anything, please feel free to contact anybody from the Secretariat as well. And um, also from the Japanese Our Hosts, um, contact information will be made available on the website. Um, so uh, thank you. Back to you. Thanks. I think at this point, if I'm reading my views correctly, that is, 
um, we should be entering in, into a little bit of a discussion of how IGF can contribute to the various processes on DESA, TAD, ITU, and UNESCO, et cetera, and so forth. And so with uh, that as an opening, I'm interested to get some feedback. Put your flag up if you want to say something. Um, if I, I can just give a, a slight summary of where we are as far as the IGF and the MAG is concerned. Um, you may be all aware that um, in early June, the MAG together with the leadership panel um, submitted to the co-facilitators of the GDC process. Um, the, that's the ambassadors of Sweden and Rwanda, a proposal for a multi-stakeholder sounding board. Um, uh, I know it was on the MAG list, and uh, most of you did, uh, most of you MAG members did um, participate in um, drafting um, that. Uh, so that was sent to the um, co-facilitators, and the co-facilitators did respond. Um, they responded last week, and they uh, said that they greatly appreciated the IGF's contributions, and though um, they cannot make any formal changes to their process now, uh, given the offer of um, the sounding board, uh, they still want to um, closely engage with the IGF over the coming weeks and months um, for the GDC um, process. They also mentioned that they will be um, traveling to Geneva in the fall to engage with the IGF community, and they will also be in Kyoto in October. So, um, and when they're there again, I think we, we, we can add a town hall for them so that they can interact with the um, um, IGF community. Um, on the 29th of June as well, the um, tech envoy also personally briefed the leadership panel um, on the DDC preparations, and there was a good discussion with the um, uh, tech envoy, and he also agreed to keep the um, IGF, um, the leadership panel, um, informed on these developments. Unfortunately, he could not be here, though he did want to be here, but um, there is also just, I mean, he was scheduled to be here, but then there is also a meeting that's going on in um, Belgium, and the Secretary General is going to be there, so he has to accompany the Secretary General, so um, he does send his Apologies for not being able to come, but the intent was for him to come uh, and um, uh, have a discussion um, with us. Um, <clears throat> so, um, also last week, with the um, on the uh, virtual call with the leadership panel, um, it was also agreed that. Um, that uh, the leadership panel will continue to work with the MAG um, to provide input into the GDC and um, including some of the aspects of the policy brief. And as you know, there's going to be the ministerial meeting in September and uh, hopefully we are going to have the results of that and we can um, have that uh, discussed in the Kyoto um, IGF with the co-facilitators there as well. Um, so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and so sorry for again speaking. Amrita Chaudhary for the record. Um, last week we had a civil society call with the co-facilitators um, regarding the GDC, and there was a discussion um, from the MAG, Bruna and I were there in that call. Um, so we did discuss that uh, perhaps rather than creating a new forum, the IGF can evolve uh, to meet the requirements uh, which are coming up. And the co-facilitators then asked if we could give a proposal on how the IGF could, you know, the, 
evolution of IGF and how it could meet the requirements. So possibly uh, we would be putting it up to the working group strategy to if you know some kind of a draft can be formed and shared with the MAG and the leadership panel to be submitted um, you know with the inputs from the DCs and the others so um, as in we can definitely submit not necessarily it will be accepted but we can show some roadmap okay good uh, it's also very important to be uh, also cognizant of the resources because we've had uh, a lot of these um, ideas and the very good ideas, IGF plus, you know, that was great, but um, they also have to be tied to how can we get the resources uh, to implement these ideas. Mm. Uh, you have to turn your... <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, and fantastic to see everyone today. Uh, Roz Kenny Birch, Observer um, from the United Kingdom. Um, just to say, we are very much looking forward to attending the 2023 UN IGF in Kyoto, Japan, and express sincere appreciation to Japan for updating us today on your excellent progress to organize this year's IGF. Um, and it's fantastic to be here today as well, just as the IGF's national and regional initiatives are in the thick of their work over the summer. Uh, Eurodig concluded just a few weeks ago, and the Africa IGF submissions portal closed just uh, last Friday. Um, so certainly some exciting regional initiatives coming up. And indeed, the UK national IGF will take place tomorrow, where there will be a key focus on topics that align with the UN IGF's 2023 themes, including internet fragmentation. But one focus I wanted to highlight in particular that has emerged from the IGF NRIs that have been held so far this year is the importance of UN processes currently underway, which encompass internet governance, as we're speaking about now, namely the Global Digital Compact, but also the WISIS Plus 20 review process. At Eurodig, there were good discussions on both, not least on the opportunities for the Global Digital Compact, as long as it highlights and complements the work of the UN IGF rather than replicates it. We look forward to further discussion on the GDC, including the co-facilitators issues paper and their response to the proposed multi-stakeholder steering board, a proposal put forward by the IGF strategy working group. We had hoped for an update on the GDC from the UN Tech Envoy in Kyoto, particularly given the centrality of the IGF's contributions to this global effort. The GDC must endorse the IGF's role and avoid fragmentation at the governance layer of the internet. Introducing new bodies with similar remits could result in duplication of resources, replication of work tracks, and overlapping processes. It is critical that the GDC includes and emphasizes multi-stakeholder participation, looking beyond the ministerial meeting scheduled for September this year. The WISIS Plus 20 review process, which culminates at the UN in late 2025, is also underway, and it is important that this process is not overshadowed or conflated by continuing work on the GDC. It was in the Tunis agenda that the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance was agreed and the IGF's mandate was first established. As we stated at the first open consultations, the 2023 IGF schedule should include a plenary session on WISIS Plus 20 to allow the IGF community to share ideas for how we can all prepare for and contribute to this important review. We also very much welcome the MAG's excellent initiative in including a sub-theme this year on global digital governance and cooperation. This will provide an important space to discuss upcoming digital governance processes, including both WISIS Plus 20 and the GDC. In closing, and reiterating the comments we made at the first open consultations in Vienna, multi-stakeholderism, including the key role of the UN IGF as a multi-stakeholder fora, has been instrumental in supporting the development of a global and open internet. We look forward to celebrating the successes of this model at the 2023 UN IGF. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Thanks, Paul. Um, Chris Buckridge, AG member, apologizing again for taking the floor on this open consultation day. Um, 
Uh, I had a couple of questions from the, the points that you made, Chengatai. Um, specifically, you mentioned the co-facilitators are planning to be in Geneva in the fall to engage with the IGF community. And I was wondering what the occasion would be for that um, and whether we need to be planning that and considering that in, in our calendars and our, our sort of uh, what, what to anticipate. Also noting that I believe the ministerial event attached to the some of the future is in September, um, I guess, in New York. So whether this is sort of linked to that. Um, and I know that we're, we've been discussing, and I think uh, Christina Rita actually raised it on the last working group strategy call, um, that that will take place before this year's IGF. And so there's a need for certainly the MAG and the leadership panel to um, align and have some discussion about how we intend to engage in that um, ministerial event. Building a little bit on what Amrita was saying um, about the discussion, I, I think we've had a number of uh, discussions in the working group strategy and with some MAG colleagues and others um, on useful documentation or communication that we could be working on right now. Uh, I think I sort of I see three sort of specific areas where we could usefully contribute um, to this. I think one is to identify and really highlight for people that the IGF in the last two decades and specifically in the last decade has evolved, has improved um, to meet new challenges, to meet new needs. Um, I think there are still open suggestions and recommendations from, for instance, last year's expert group meeting, um, which we could also point to as, as evolution in progress and things that can still be developed further. And I think then, thirdly, we, we need to really be looking to identify the specific possibilities for evolution that could meet the new needs that the GDC is going to provide. So looking at how the IGF could meet those needs that other parties are looking to create new bodies for, whether that's a digital cooperation forum or a um, commission, as the HLAB has, has discussed. Um, so I certainly want to take the opportunity of the open consultation to encourage not just MAG members, but others to take part in those working group strategy calls where generally meeting once every two weeks and we have had sort of very practical discussions of um, creating some of these documents. For instance, the, the proposal on the, um, uh, the sounding board for the GDC. And just finally, so to, to your point, Chengatai, I mean, I, I think resource availability is absolutely an important consideration and, and something we need to think about. But we should also stress that really all of the options being considered, whether it's the Digital Cooperation Forum or other things, will require resources. So this whole discussion is about new resources, new levels of, of investment here. Um, and really building on what we have in the IGF is not only sort of to, to sort of further strengthen and build on that multi-stakeholder approach, it's actually to build and consolidate on the, the investment that we've already made in the IGF here. So I think it's really, in many ways, the most efficient and, and um, sensible approach in that regard. So something to keep in mind, but thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can I just one thing? Mm -hmm. uh, um, thanks, Chris. Just answering you quickly um, on uh, the statement that the uh, co facilitators made in the response letter saying that they'll be coming here in the fall to um, discuss with the IGF community. We do not know the details as of yet, but as soon as we do, we will let you know. Okay, thanks. That's right. <coughs> uh, Walter Natas, good morning, everybody. Good, good to see you here. Um, we have an intersessional event this afternoon, so I will try to keep my powder as dry as possible, but I will stress one point and then a second one. Um, where we are talking about IGF messages and tangible outcomes, a suggestion could be in the future to look at how that ties in to other organizations. So it's nice to have a message digitally on the IGF, web, IGF website, but you can wonder how many people in the world read that. If you translate that into some sort of an action, 
it means that other organizations have to become involved. So that could be, for example, the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, that they could actually make it actionable in one of their programs. It could be through the EU or the African Union Commission or the Organization of American States so that it ties into their programs. And then you start making a difference as an IGF. And that's a point that I've made that I will make again this afternoon. The second one is that, as you know, I'm coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security and Safety. And we're getting about ready with our first, or our second and third major report. And I'm the coordinator, so I can't tell you for 100% if this is actually correct, but it's starting to look like the following, that a lot of organizations talk about the public core of the internet and that that needs protection. What I'm finding out in the research as coordinator is that governments do not recognize that core of the internet because what makes the internet work are the internet standards developed by the technical community. And they're not part of legislation, they're not a part of regulation. So how can you actually protect them if they're not part of your legislation? And I think that that may be a topic that the IGF wants to address because it's that public core of the internet that is being attacked by everybody in the world who wants to 24 hours a day. And I think that that is something we may want to address because it, I'm almost certain that that will be the overarching outcome of our research in Kyoto. And that's what I wanted to share here because I think it's important enough to discuss together. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Ankhtad, and then after that, Nigel. Um, my name is Dmitry Plikhanov. I'm a representative um, of UNCTAD and the Commission on Science and Technology for Development under the Economic and Social Council. I would like to follow up on the intervention made by the United Kingdom. Uh, I would like to draw to your attention that uh, CSTD, in collaboration with the uh, Government of Japan, will host uh, an event on the second day um, of the forum of IGF. Uh, the event will uh, look at the VCS uh, review process, its successes, failures, and expectations. It will bring together multi-stakeholders, uh, including representatives from governments, civil society, private sector, academia, and the technical communities involved in ICT development. The discussion will, fo will focus on, fo on, on a number of topics, the first one is to what extent and how has the vision of a people-centered, inclusive and development-oriented information society evolved over the past 20 years since this is. The second uh, theme um, is on ongoing trends and emerging technologies, especially AI, as well as impact progress towards human development and the sustainable development goals. The discussion will also focus on the measures that should be taken to advance international cooperation, including in terms of governance, to leverage emerging technologies for sustainable development in economic, social, and cultural dimensions. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Nigel? <coughs> Sorry, yes. Good, good, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. thank you. All right. Yeah, well, good. Yeah. Good to uh, good to see everyone. I'll be very brief indeed. Uh, uh, apologies for not being with you, but uh, yeah, not everyone can be either. Uh, I just wanted to say two things. One, to uh, uh, to to really ask in in, in light of the uh, in light of the news that the uh, uh, the uh, leadership panel had a discussion with the co-facilitators. That's really positive, um, and. Uh, I, you know, I just wondered whether the uh, uh, the digital cooperation forum, as proposed in the uh, in the Secretary General's uh, policy report, was was touched on at all, and how the how how the IGF could uh, could ho hopefully have a have a role there. But I, I I guess that's for future discussions as well. And 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 secondly, to 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 thank our uh, to thank our Japanese colleagues for. Uh, Obviously, uh, hosting in, in in Kyoto and the information they uh, they imparted this morning, and the question I would have had for them, and 
if this has been answered, then you, you just please just ignore me. Uh, is 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 whether if if we're hoping to uh, if countries are hoping to have a minister in uh, in in Kyoto, then whether we uh, whether there's any special protocol we ought to uh, be engaged with with our our, our Japanese hosts. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and, uh, Jorge. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Jorge Cancio, Swiss government, uh, for the record. Hope you hear me okay. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the Secretariat and, of course, our Japanese hosts uh, for all the preparations. This is looking uh, very good. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, thanks for, for, the, for the whole of uh, the efforts. Uh, one thing that struck me a little bit is uh, whether the uh, high-level sessions that are being prepared, uh, whether there is a good dialogue with the main session organizers of uh, the MAC, uh, because it would be great to have a fully integrated program as far as possible and avoid uh, duplications between the MAC-led program and the host country program. So I hope uh, we still have time to to coordinate as much as possible so that the the program is, is really consistent all over uh, its extension. Um, another point that uh, uh, I found very interesting is uh, the the reference you made uh, to the exchange with the co-facilitators. Uh, I hope that uh, they have acknowledged the uh, inputs uh, from the IGF so, so far, especially the, the ADIS messages in the format that was brought forward to them by the leadership panel. I think that was a, quite a, a useful exercise and uh, regarding the, the response they have given to, to this idea of a sounding board, um, I, I would love to see that uh, in writing, if there's uh, anything in writing. And in any case, I think that's a good basis to, uh, even if it's not called a sounding board, to, to have a structured approach to that uh, dialogue uh, so that we have... Uh, some uh, some strategic thinking on how we engage with them and uh, we cover all the the aspects that are important to to this community uh, both uh, from the content side uh, so the the different uh, fields that are being covered by the by the global digital compact discussions and also from the institutional side and uh, there, I think that uh, one uh, point of discussion that would be very important and that uh, was already stressed by the leadership panel in its input is to uh, engage in a, in a dialogue with the co-facilitators on where the IGF can really offer without any special additional um, burden uh, this evaluation and follow-up function to the Global Digital Compact. And uh, we've seen the, the proposal in the, in the policy uh, paper from, from Amandeep and uh, maybe a, a mapping uh, as a one-pager or as a two-pager of the functions uh, laid down there and the functions that already exist in the mandate of the IGF could be useful in order to, to showcase how easily those functions could be taken over by the IGF. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Chris mentioned before, of course, uh, the, one, of the, one of the political guidelines that the member states have given to this process uh, according to the resolution that governs this uh, process and the summit for the future is to avoid duplications. So we should uh, really stick to that 
because it's more efficient, it's less expensive, and what is more important, it's more inclusive, because the more fora you have, the less, the, the smaller delegations, the smaller organizations can participate in those. Only the bigger countries or the wealthier countries or organizations will be able to do it. So I think that's an important thought and uh, something that we uh, should be discussing with the co-facilitators in this hopefully structured dialogue. So I'll leave it by that and thank you very much. Thank you. In Switzerland, and uh, I guess we Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Jorge. And noted, yes, we will make sure that there's no duplication and overlap about the sessions. And just responding quickly to Nigel uh, and to anybody else, um, if there are any um, VVIPs that are coming, please do um, inform the Secretariat so that we can keep a list of them. And um, then we can also share it with, the, um, with our Japanese hosts. And also, as I said, it also helps with the accommodation. As I said, there's only one hotel that's close by. But it's also good to know um, who is coming, and we might be able to involve them in um, some of the sessions that we are planning. Yeah. Okay. Judy. Okay, th thanks a lot uh, for giving me the floor. So, and thanks for this opportunity to intervene in this in such important topic. I want just to add my voices to the one and uh, the thoughts that have already been expressed by Chris and by Jorge on uh, uh, global uh, digital cooperation. I think it's important I mean, to discuss more and also to share information on this important uh, topic um, because. Uh, uh, as you know, the um, IGF has evolved in this year to respond to all the solicitation that have been um, uh, that came from the UN Secretary General Initiative, like uh, the roadmap for digital cooperation, the high-level panel of digital cooperation, the, our common report. So there are new processes that have been included in the IGF to improve the global digital cooperation. So, and then I think that this process should be considered, considered, and also. Uh, used to create a more closer cooperation between the IGF and the uh, global digital uh, uh, compact processes. And the further, I think that it's uh, very important to open some discussion on, on the, um, how the IGF could evolve, what are the main difference between the global, uh, the, the digital cooperation forum and the, and the IGF in order to create a constructive dialogue to avoid uh, um, duplication. Um, as uh, Chris um, and the other told uh, yeah, before of me, there is a lot of discussion on this, on the, um, on, uh, the Mark Working Group, on IGF strategy. So I think that all this contribution could, could uh, be used to create a very constructive uh, dialogue and to, to create a more close uh, uh, participation between uh, GDC processes and also the process that have been uh, led by the co-facilitator of the GDC. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Any more flags? Anyone online? Uh, nobody else. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Mag member for record. Uh, I, I just want to uh, emphasize that in the ministerial meetings in September, uh, I think people should know that uh, the IGF is not, it's not the only conference. It's the whole ecosystem consists of intersessional work, consists of a group working at, around the globe. And I think that replicating that or even try to, to build something similar will take years of years of, of contribution and, and outreach. So I think it's, it's very important that uh, I, I will just uh, yani, uh, add to what Chris said that uh, we should have a clear uh, proposition for the ministerial meetings in September uh, in alignment with the leadership panel. Thank you. Thank you, Bruna. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, Bruna Sensenek, MEC member as well. Yeah, just to reinforce this thing about um, us having a clear idea and moving forward. This meeting some of civil society organizations had last week with the co-facilitators was 
super interesting in the sense of like learning what are the next steps and what should be doing and in which moments um, actually the our opinion is relevant and um, we also offered um, to have some sort of like um, a conversation with the MAG if there was interest for the to the COFAX and the idea is try to facilitate that but I just use the part as well that we need to have a clear picture on what are our plans beyond the sounding board kind of thing and how we're pushing for that because it should be really relevant to start like chatting with them ahead of the September meeting so that's it. Thank you. So I don't see any additional hands up, but I would like to throw out a question for all of you to think about and, and respond to. In the discussion up to this point in time, there's been a, a great deal of saying more or less that we should all be doing these things. Um, and we've, the discussion's been in the framework of the IGF doing these things or the GDC process doing these things and bringing these things together. But I haven't heard very much, if any, discussion about how we get the implementers of the ecosystem to actually affect the change that we want. And I'm wondering, because in terms of action, I'm trying to have some actions that have outcomes, if any of you here, especially those of you who are not MAG members, but um, have ideas for how we can position the IGF better in the global system that includes all of the implementers, by which I mean the, the large tech companies, the small tech companies, but those that actually have, have a, a say in and a mandate to actually implement what we're all talking about. Because it struck me that we're, we're saying largely very good, positive things. And I, and I think that's, that we have come a great distance since IGF started, but it does, does seem a little bit like we're walking up to the edge of the cliff and we haven't figured out how we wanna bridge the, bridge the gap. And I'm wondering if you have ideas that could be put into the hopper to address that. Oh. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Walter Natris. Um, I think I gave a few examples in what I just said on how to achieve that. I will start with my own dynamic coalition and what we try to do at this point in time is that we've been talking to the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise on our, our outcomes, perhaps, a part of what you're trying to achieve. Um, if things go right, then I will go to Ghana at the end of November to instigate the discussion. We are trying to get a cyber hub on cybersecurity tertiary education going in the world, and we hope to announce that at the IGF in Kyoto. But we will need some sort of support to actually do that. And if we get all these different stakeholders in to talk about improving Cyber, tertiary cybersecurity education, then the IGF will actually get something very tangible done. This is just two examples. Let me stop there because we're doing a lot more. And that's all from a dynamic coalition that is not even recognized when we have a report as an IGF outcome. For the IGF itself, I think that it becomes tremendously important at this point in time, having the discussions that we just have, is to start discussing with other organizations what their issues are and being disrespectful and i'm not meaning that but the world looks at workshops as talk shops and that is the fact so if we rely mostly on workshops we will never be taken as seriously as the potential of the igf could be so I've been saying for a few years, perhaps it should be 50% workshops and 50% workshops, where actually work is being done between different organizations that have identified an issue they would want to discuss at the global level. 
And if we can get these sort of organizations to come to the IGF and discuss and come up with a tangible outcome or a program, then the IGF will have extra value. And that is something which is revolutionary and is not, not add up to the max mandate. And I'm totally aware of that, but it's something we may want to discuss if we want to progress beyond 2025. So there's, there's just some of the ways that I think that within the intercessional work, perhaps we could be more proactive, but also where the IGF itself can become more proactive. And I'm not being disrespectful because I know everybody in workshops really want to get that point across and will do that with the best intentions. But they are seen as a talk shop. Thank you. Thank you. Jutta Koll, former MAC member for Civil Society from Germany. Um, Paul, you refer to the tech companies in regard of the internet governance, and uh, I do think that we should refer to the whole of industry. Uh, you might remember that we tried to do that at the IGF 2019 in, in Berlin, where we had some of the industry there uh, at the event, but I still think that looking at those people outside from the ecosystem of internet governance, they still do think that digital things are due to the technical companies. And that, that, but we need to understand that the whole of industry needs to be engaged. And I do think, I, I really appreciate that artificial intelligence features prominently in the program so far. I do think that is a very good step to engage more companies, more industry in the whole debate. And although I, I'm representing civil society, I do think we need more industry in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Giacomo. Yes, there you are. Thank you. Um, yes, my two cents ideas and proposal about it, answering to the question of the chair are we, we are already doing, we simply need to institutionalize it. Uh, as you know, in my the group that I co-chair, the ENMA, with Nina, that is with you today, uh, we are looking for uh, solutions that can be easily replicated uh, somewhere else and then can be example and best practices for all the globe. So I think that this is an added value contribution that the IGF can provide uh, to the ecosystem. And the second is that we... Uh, if you look at all the other stars in this galaxy of the, uh, the internet governance ecosystem, uh, the IGF is the only one that is truly multi-stakeholder. So I think that we need to work and that we can be essential to the process because we are the only one that can test um, problems that are controversial between the stakeholders in order to find possible way of solution probably possible way forward that can bring uh, the process at the next step. So I think that we, we have to work and to, to put, you know, put forward uh, these two elements as the crucial elements that we can bring as a specific and uh, unavoidable contribution to the internet governance process. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you, Paul. Peace, Magmigma. So I want to respond, make clarification on his submission, the gentleman at the back, that when we have about 200 workshops, I think, uh, sessions, the workshops are only taking 75. So his uh, calculations of percentages are not true. Thank you. Bruna? To make similar point to pieces, um, I do think it's kind of a, a little bit of a bias impression that it has become a talk shop kind of thing because um, we come from less, um, let's say, common, sorry? 
Yes, we come from the majority world and, and places in which like people have different opinions about things. And there is some really good and added value in allowing for the exchange of, exchange of ideas and <clears throat> perceptions or bringing in the vision of Kenya or um, Brazil to the table in the end of the day. And that's the real value of the workshops and so on. But I do think that there is something like maybe in the background that we want to address with regards to the models, perhaps, or bringing into um, a better and more streamlined perception on how far the IGF has come. And maybe it was like mostly my comment here, because whenever we joined um, the GDC um, interactions, either with the tech envoy or the co-facilitators, we keep on bringing up a lot of the changes we did in the past year. So maybe it's worth like working on a two-pager kind of thing or a report on how far have we come so far? Like how, what do all of these changes represent? The parliamentarian track, the high level track, um, the panel um, track and everything else, just so it's more um, clear for anyone that's willing to engage or think about how to build up the system from the IGF and the existing structures, um, what are the improves, like improvements needed? So maybe a suggestion should get even more clear about the changes and the improvements for the past years. There's going to be a night discussion about this. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, let me clear out these in order and then, we, then we'll be moving on. So, yes. who do we have? Sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, my brain is stuck. <laughs> You're pointing at me? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I think what, what Paul is asking is what, what's the mechanism? We, we've had a, a lot of high level comments. Well, besides Bruno, she kind of touched on it. We need to add this, we need to do that. We think that IGF is this. And, but what would the action be? What would the action be? Are we talking about using the intercessional um, groups to? look at the outcomes of IGF and use that as a basis for going forward, come back with some kind of deliverable. What's the mechanism? I, we, to me, I'm just hearing a lot of high level things, but how do we get it done? If we were to leave here today, what, what does the secretariat take away and say, well, we need this, that, A, B, C, one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. You did capture the spirit of what I was trying to ask um, accurately, so thank you. I think we um, haven't exhausted this particular talk. Oh, Chris, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I just want to stress that we are going to have a mad discussion on this topic as well, so yeah, let's okay. carry on. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Cheng. And I do realize we will have a separate discussion, but also I think we have until 12 today to in, in our current schedule. So hopefully we're not using too much time. But no, I mean, I think Carol's point and, and Paul, your original point are very important. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I'm sort of reiterating what I was saying before, but I, I, it's very easy for, the, for that to get lost in the, in the back and forth of discussion. I think we have some very specific documentation tasks that could usefully be done here, and, and Bruno also alluded to this. In terms of what has been done to evolve and improve the IGF, in terms of what is currently ongoing based on the recommendations that we have to improve the IGF, and then thirdly, in terms of what specific additional improvements could be made to meet the new needs, the newly identified needs coming out of the, the Global Digital Compact. So I think that is work that we can very practically get started on. And I think the working group strategy is probably the, the, the useful format or venue for doing that, but also um, not necessarily. We can also do it sort of in, in the mag more generally, um, but we do uh, need to get started on that practical work in terms of developing this communication. Now that's sort of a first step because then we need to sort of have some sense of how do we utilize that, who is going to be best placed to, to sort of take that messaging and um, have some influence with it. 
I think that's where the leadership panel will really come into its own. I think that's really one of the primary goals that the leadership panel was set up to meet, is carrying forward that, that messaging, that positioning, that story of the IGF to high-level policymakers and other high-level stakeholders, um, both yeah, at, within the UN, but as you say, Paul, also looking even more to the wider ecosystem of some of the private sector actors who maybe aren't as engaged as we would hope they should be, even sort of based on self-interest and, and wanting to sort of have a, a sort of um, a multi-stakeholder discussion of these policy issues. Uh, so that's the that's sort of second step, but I think the first step is absolutely getting that messaging and that story nailed down in very practical form. So I, I hope we can start moving on that quite quickly. Thank you. Uh, uh, Teresa? Thank you. <clears throat> Teresa Horisava, Mac member. Sorry for intervening now, but uh, I just want to build on what uh, Bruna and Chris uh, said, that this document with the achievements of the IGF really could be useful. And besides um, uh, maybe some more abstract conclusions about the achievements, we also, I feel, have some hard numbers to show. Uh, number of participants, uh, number of uh, session proposals from the community, uh, which is like rocket high, uh, higher and higher, you know, to me, like these numbers are really a proof uh, that the IGF not only is a very established um, uh, kind of um, forum in this respect, but that there are also expectations from the global uh, community. So maybe we could play around uh, this as well in the two page. Thank you. Rita. Thank you. And further building up, because um, the idea of a different platform or the discussions in GDC is that there is a gap and that needs to be addressed. That is the basic issue. And that's why the discussions of a forum, etc. So building upon the information of what IGF has been doing, or if, for example, if you're looking at access and there are issues about digital divide, we are talking, and I'm just talking about one particular se segment, we are talking about uh, the divides in uh, usage, the divides in uh, access. And then we say, okay, in the last three years, this is what IGF has been discussing. These may be the gaps, and this is where we may want to build up. Because the narrative which I understand, and my understanding may be wrong, that many developing countries feel they are not represented in IGF, which is incorrect. Uh, you know, the interests of developing nations and developed nations are quite different. Many times, many feel that topics are being reiterated or repeated like access, but that is very important for us in developing countries. So uh, trying to balance the interests of both sides is important, and that is what we can highlight in our documentation, that these are issues, this is how we are trying to um, build a narrative or build discussions, and I think that is critical because... Um, the discussions of new forms of discussion platforms is primarily because people identify it as a gap. Um, so I think those narratives need to be strengthened with all justifications which we have. And where we do not have, we have to say, look, this is how we can improve. All right. Great, thank you. Uh, Roz Kenny Birch, observer um, from the UK, and I just really wanted to come in on a few of these points um, because it's quite an interesting discussion. Um, but obviously, the MAG's engaging in its important work this week to select sessions for the IGF, design the program. Um, and I'd really just like to support uh, the comments that have been uh, brought up that this year's forum must focus on highlighting the whole breadth of work undertaken by IGF initiatives uh, year round. Uh, put succinctly, the MAG should highlight not just the annual forum, but also the vital role the IGF plays beyond this annual forum. Um, take the IGF multi-stakeholder policy networks, um, which were brought up earlier in the discussion. Both the policy network on internet fragmentation and the policy network on meaningful access will present recommendations in time for the IGF in October. Um, these will offer rich analysis from an array of perspectives, not simply relying on government experience, but also expertise drawn from businesses and local communities. 
it will be important to highlight the role of these networks during the IGF and also to consider how the wider IGF community might seek to assess, respond to, or take forward these recommendations. We need to make it clear to stakeholders around the world that the IGF's work does not solely revolve around the annual forum. These policy networks meet and work and complete rich work year round. Um, in addition, the IGF's national and regional initiatives also, of course, take place year round. These are an excellent opportunity for the multi-stakeholder community, civil society, the private sector, and governments to come together and explore emerging and long-standing policy issues through a local lens and build new networks within their regions. Developing cross-sectoral relationships is intrinsic to the value of the IGF. Governments can learn about enabling innovation from the private sector and about the challenges local communities face from civil society experts, for example. The MAG should give special attention to how networking opportunities can be built into the IGF agenda to enable participants to link up with their local regions. Again, the NRI showed that the IGF, IGF's work goes well beyond the annual global forum. In conclusion, the IGF is not a singular forum. It is a community process which works year round to address public policy challenges, not just in the internet governance space, but in the broader digital policy space. It is an actionable forum. While its messages are not prescribed, governments, civil society, and the private sector take advantage of the knowledge and analysis imparted to achieve better digital outcomes. It is a forum which operates on the principle of inclusivity, the principle that the best decisions can be made when different groups, sometimes siloed, are able to come together and actually talk with one another. The UK government will enthusiastically and actively participate at this year's forum, and we will do so not just to share our views, but to listen to and incorporate the views of others. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I cut somebody else off before Roz talked. Yeah. Okay, thank you for giving me the floor once again. Jutta Kroll, civil society, former MAC member. From everything that was said within the last five minutes, I got the impression that everybody tries to justify that there is an internet governance forum. And I, I don't think we need to justify, I don't think we have to give evidence about of the achievements uh, of the Internet Governance Forum. There are so many questions out there with the fast evolving uh, Internet environment and the Internet Governance Forum has to give answers to these questions. And, and that needs to be recognized, that we are able to give the answers to these pressing questions that are out there. And Again, I want to refer to artificial intelligence because that is an area where now so many people have questions. We don't have a proper regulation for artificial intelligence. We are just looking at these developments, and I'm pretty sure that the Internet Governance, Governance Forum is able to give the answers to these questions, and that I would like to stress. Thank you. Thank you. This Consulate, but as I said, I'm running yeah, thank you very much, um, Consulate, speaking from the Gambian NRI. I just want to um, emphasize about the role within the NRIs, especially at the national level, in terms of um, how it has driven a number of um, countries in Africa to be able to enact policies from cybersecurity to better protection and privacy. And I think it's important to um, recognize that apart from the regional IGFs, at national levels, a lot is taking place in which um, stakeholders from all levels, especially business, civil society, are working with their governments to implement policies. For example, I will give you um, 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 just um, one in, in the case of the Gambia, whereby because of our um, national IGF, our government finally signed the Malabo Convention. And these are things a lot of um, other African countries I know within their national um, IGFs are trying um, to do to, to make us get a, a good number. So at the national level, a lot of things is happening, and I think we should bring 
um, that to light. And that is why the importance of the intercessional it, it gives a lot of value to the um, great work we are doing in f um, policy formulations that will affect people at the grassroots level in our various communities. Thank you. And thank you. Yes, this is plus 20. Okay. Mm, update. Real-time program development. Um, so we'll switch to the uh, updates on um, the WSIS Plus 20 consultation. And um, I think we have some sign, we have Wyman from DESA and Freedom from ITU and Angel from UNCTAD. So if Wyman's not on the line, then I'd like to invite Dennis to say a few words. Thank you, Shengitai. Uh, I, I see Wyman is just typing. I think you are getting the message. If he's not available, I'll be happy to, to make some notes on his behalf. Uh, so, okay, uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Denis Susar, uh, Governance and Public Administration Officer at UNDESA. Uh, as the Headquarters Space Secretariat Department, uh, we are mandated to provide and coordinate Secretariat support service uh, to the General Assembly high level events, including uh, BCIS Plus 20. The upcoming VCIS uh, Plus 20 review by the General Assembly in 2025 will also, uh, as you all know, be the IGF's 20 year review. Uh, resolution 70 uh, slash 125 uh, requests the General Assembly to hold a high level meeting on the overall review of the implementation of the outcomes of the World Summit on the Information Society in 2025, uh, as you know, this is plus 20, and involving the input and participation of all stakeholders, including the preparatory process, to take stock of progress on the outcomes of the VCIS uh, and identify both areas of continued focus and challenges. This resolution I coded is from 2015, and you can uh, have a look at it. And this uh, resolution also recommends that the outcome of the high level meeting be considered as an input into the review process for the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. As was the case for the VCIS plus 10 review in 2015, uh, DESA uh, will provide and coordinate secretariat support uh, to the VCIS plus 20 high level meeting and also will uh, coordinate the input and participation of all agencies and stakeholders. We are uh, still uh, working with uh, within DESA and with other agencies in the proposed milestones. I will uh, just mention a few uh, to, uh, to be with you. Uh, for example, we will produce a series of issues, papers and uh, policy briefs uh, on the past 20 years progress on the outcomes of this is and identify both areas of continued focus and challenges. This will be happening uh, starting from October 2023. Together with colleagues in ANCTAD, uh, we plan to support the GA uh, in adopting the modalities resolution. Uh, this will again uh, happen uh, October 2023, June 2024. Uh, then uh, we will be supporting the President of the General Assembly in appointing two co-facilitators. Uh, uh, of course, after that, we, there will be issue for call for written inputs and submissions. And also there will be some regional and thematic consultations. Uh, a non-paper will be issued by the Office of the PGA in uh, support, supported by DESA, uh, inviting public comments. This will be happening in uh, uh, third quarter of uh, 2025, and then of, and then there will be uh, like uh, GA in negotiations uh, in New York for until November 2025. 
uh, of course, all the efforts will be made to align all related outputs and outcomes and expectations of the global digital compact uh, to the Visis Plus 20 preparatory and consultative process. And, and, it, and we should be uh, uh, clear that there are still some uh, uh, plannings uh, happening in this, in this area, both with the GTC and, uh, uh, and SDG summit. And finally, uh, we are, of course, very mindful that the VCS Plus 20 process will be a, a whole of the UN system effort as well as a multi stakeholder. So we are fully committed to work closely with all uh, UN entities and other stakeholder groups. For example, we plan to coordinate the input and participation of UN agencies and other international organizations. We know, uh, I mentioned already, IGF plus 20 review process. We know that uh, CSCD's VCS plus 20 roadmap uh, supported by ANCTAD, uh, ITU's VCS plus 20 roadmap, and uh, the upcoming VCS 2024 uh, annual meeting as a, a high level uh, meeting uh, for the VCS uh, and UNESCO's work in the same area, but also as well as uh, there are other UN regional commissions um, which will be having consultations uh, in that. Finally, uh, yeah, we are committed to work with all UN agencies, international government organizations and uh, stakeholders, uh, and, and we we work to, uh, we, pl we hope to work closely with all of you uh, with Mac uh, as well in this process. Thank you, Shengetai, and back to you. Thank you, Chair. Back to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, we'll have, um, uh, we've just had this, so we'll have ITU, UNCTAD, and maybe UNESCO, and then we can open it up for questions and a discussion. So, um, Pritam? ITU. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to everyone. My apologies that I couldn't be there in person. This is also happening, you know, the MAG meetings and the consultations are also happening in parallel to the ITU council meetings. So uh, we are all multitasking here, unfortunately. So uh, so the uh, preparations for the Business Plus 20 review process are going on. Uh, in fact, the ITU Secretary General has an input document on this topic to the ITU Council, which is starting tomorrow, as I said. You know, we've also received member state contributions, and these contributions will be discussed in detail. Um, just in terms of uh, prep, you know, our uh, dedicated council working group on VISIS and SDGs initiated a discussion on the role of ITU in the VISIS Plus 20 review process and its preparations. Uh, we also had uh, detailed discussions at the plenipotentiary conference, uh, you know, where we had the uh, SecGen's uh, report elaborating the role of ITU in the VSIS uh, Plus 20 review process. And several sessions uh, on the review process were also held at the VSIS Forum 22, 23, you know, with the participation of all stakeholders. The discussions covered examples of, you know, reporting templates uh, that could be used for the VSIS Action Line facilitators, you know, for civil society and for countries. Uh, as uh, Denise already mentioned, you know, the VSIS Plus 20 uh, uh, forum, you know, the high level event is scheduled for 27 to 31st of May uh, 2024 in Geneva, and it will be formally hosted by the government of Switzerland. Uh, it will serve as a platform for the VSIS Plus 20 review and will enable multi stakeholder discussions on the progress made in the implementation of the VSIS outcomes under the mandates of the different participating agencies. Um, this event uh, is also expected to take stock of the achievements of the last 20 years uh, based on the reports from the stakeholders, including countries, action line facilitators, and others. Uh, also, following the instructions of the ITU uh, plenipotentiary conference uh, resolution 140, uh, the, IT, the ITU secretary general is coordinating with the various uh, other UN agencies uh, on the implementation of uh, ITU's uh, you know, VSIS Plus 20 roadmap. Uh, for the preparation uh, and also the conducting of the VSIS Plus 20 review process and VSIS process beyond 2025. And this is consistent with uh, UNGA's uh, VSIS Plus 20 uh, prep process. Uh, again, uh, you know, just to reiterate, in collaboration with UNESCO, UNDP, CSTD, DESA, and other UN agencies, the VSIS Plus 20 review process 
will be a multi stakeholder process conducted in different phases with on site and uh, you know online and physical uh, participation uh, and uh, the aim of this review process would be to develop consensus text on the vision of visas beyond 2025 ideally endorsed during the uh, high level meeting uh, during uh, anga 2025 uh, again, to re-emphasize, as a multi-stakeholder process, uh, we believe that VISIS has uh, uh, stood the test of time, the VISIS outcome documents, and the review process is expected to provide a guidance framework for all stakeholders based on the VISIS outcome documents for opportunities and challenges posed by the uh, current digital landscape. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of GDC, the secretary, ITU secretariat is contributing to the process. Uh, and we are also ensuring synergies and coherence throughout the business plus 20 review process so that, you know, it's in sync with what's happening with the GDC and uh, the processes related to the R common agenda, the global digital compact, we believe are complementary to the business framework. And uh, we are working to avoid duplication of existing multi stakeholder processes and to foster synergies between the business plus 20 process and the preparations for the summit of the future and the GDC. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shangatai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have um, Angel from Mountad. Thank you, Changita. First of all, let me clarify a little bit uh, the relation between CSDD and UNCTED. I'm going to speak actually on behalf of uh, both UNCTED and CSDD because CSDD, which is the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development, is mandated by ECOSOCON General Assembly to conduct uh, CS with this, uh, review, including the WISIS uh, uh, Plus 20 review. But uh, CSDD is served by the UNCTED Secretariat, so I have, I'm doing two jobs at the same time. <coughs> And as I've said, the CSD has been mandated uh, um, by both ECOSOC and General Assembly to review uh, annually the progress implementing the WISIS outcomes. It has also played a key role in the WISIS plus 10 year review by contributing inputs to the review in the General Assembly in 2015. For the WISIS plus 20 uh, reviews, the ECOSOC adopted a resolution in July this year requesting the CSD to collect inputs from all stakeholders and to organize substantive discussions in 2024 at its 27th annual session and in 2025 at its 28th annual session. And at the CSED in March this year, the member states welcomed the roadmap that was presented by the CSED chair. And since then, the CSD secretariat has been preparing for the review based on the roadmap. And in the roadmap, the CSED secretariat is going to prepare a synthesis report that will take stock not only the implementation of the WISIS in the past 20 years, but also to take a long, longer view and also a forward-looking view. So the issues to be addressed in the report will include the dynamic processes of change in the information society that have taken place in technology, in the development, access and use of ICTs, and their impact on development, including in its economic, social and cultural dimensions the environmental human rights and other critical relevant areas. It, should, it will also consider how ongoing trends and likely new developments will affect progress towards human development in the future using the SDGs as the basic template for the analysis, considering that the WISIS Plus 20 review will also provide an input to the more comprehensive review process for the 2030 agenda. The first draft of the report will be provided as background for the substantive discussion in 2024, and the final report will be made available for the discussion in 2025 at the CSDD. Now, the report will also include as inputs the outcomes of the consultations that we are going to carry out in various forms. And this open consultation will start from the last quarter of 2023. In fact, it will commence with our launch event at the Kyoto IGF Forum, which has been mentioned by my colleague a moment ago. And this consultation will last until late 2024. 20, 
and we're also going to open uh, have this kind of open consultation together with uh, our other UN agencies, our national governments, the private sector, civil society, the tech and communities, with the co concern with the development of ICTs, uh, digital development, and development more generally. So the forms will take in in various ways. First of all, we are going to organize three regional consultations in collaboration with three regional um, commissions, as well as ITU regional offices and the regional office of UNESCO and UNDP. And secondly, we are going to uh, organize a joint event with ITU and UNESCO in next year's WISIS Forum. Thirdly, we are going to carry out an online joint survey with ITU, UNESCO, and UNDP. In fact, uh, the draft questionnaire has been prepared and the uh, parties are, being, um, are, are reviewing this questionnaire. I think it will be rolled out uh, uh, soon, and we invite also the IGF community to um, take part in these surveys. And then we're also going to uh, carry out other activities that may arise from discussions with stakeholders. The scope and depth of the consultation and analytical activities in this roadmap are dependent on the availability of extra budgetary financial support from member states because CSD does not have funds to do that kind of work. And we invite both CSD members and non-CSD members to contribute to, uh, to, to support our work in this regard. So we have a WISIS Trust Fund that is ready to accept the funds. I think I will conclude my uh, introduction here. Thank you, Chin Dagi. Thank you very much. And we have some time to uh, discuss how IGF, IGF, how IGF can contribute to the processes we've just heard about. So I'll open the floor to any comments, questions. Any clarifications that somebody might want? Nothing. Let me just check online. Henriette, please. Um, thank you very much, Shengatai. I'm Henriette Esterhuisen from um, South Africa, past MAG member and MAG chair from APC, Association for Progressive Communications. Um, I just really want to um, thank both the ITU and the CSTD UNCTAD representatives for their inputs. Um, you know, as someone from the, the developing world, the WISIS is, is absolutely still a very, very important process for us. And, um, and I think it's, you know, there are other processes underway as well, but we should not neglect the, the 20 years of work that has gone into WISIS implementation. Um, and so I think just, Paul, maybe in response to your question, I think that it would be um, possibly through the Secretariat and the Working Group Strategy and other interested MAG members to connect, to actually consult and engage with the ITU and CSTD um, on how to respond to Paul's question about how the IGF can contribute to these processes. I think in a sense though, we've heard that it is already contributing. I think the fact that CSTD is using the IGF as a platform um, um, for um, aspects of its process illustrates how the IGF can be used. I think where the, the value add can be, can be through the NRIs. And maybe that can be the, the, the subject of this consultation between the ITU and CSTD and the IGF um, to look at how one can in the coming 18 months um, utilize the, the local ownership, the local content of the NRIs to contribute to the work they are doing um, to go into the WISIS review process. Thanks, Shengatai. Back to you and Paul. Thank you. Any further thoughts from anyone in the audience? Chris. Thank you, Paul. Um, I just actually wanted to reinforce or agree with Henriette there. I think there is a really important role here um, 
for the ITU and for um, those of us in the IGF community to work with the ITU um, in making sure that two decades of WISIS and IGF experience is, is reflected and, and incorporated into these newly energized discussions that are going on in New York and that are taking place in relation to the Global Digital Compact um, and to all that's going on there. I, I think they are complementary, but the links, and at, in terms of moving very quickly, in terms of a, a need to sort of look at new processes and new needs to be addressed, those links are in danger at times of being overlooked or not fully understood. And I think this does come back to the point we were making earlier about the need for documentation of getting the narrative straight of putting it into a digestible format. Um, but I think the ITU is, is a really key um, ally and partner in, in doing that and in making sure that the, the hard work that's gone on for the past two decades is reflected in this new work that's taking place. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair uh, Valtanatris. Um, I think how silent it remains in general after your question also tells us something. And I'm not in a position to discuss these topics because I'm just an independent, uh, what do you call it, consultant. But the question I would like to pose is who is actually responsible to liaise with these organizations? Is that a MAG member? Is that the IGF Secretariat? Is that UNDESA? Who is it? Because somebody will have to deliver the content that Chris is mentioning here. And I think that getting the narrative straight, of the, uh, I've called it many times through the years, to, to celebrate the successes of the IGF, and it seems something that seems very hard to do for this community. But the successes are there, but who is going to be responsible to communicate them? And I think that that is something that needs to be cited on today because otherwise probably it will hang in the air for another half year and then all of a sudden the review is ready without real input by the IGF. That's something we're in fear of. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know the answer to that question. I think part of the answer to the question, or most of the answer to the question, has to come from the community, not from ones or twos of uh, individual people. And, and also, this is something that we can discuss, the MAG can discuss with the leadership panel um, in their meeting. Um, and the secretary will, of course, obviously um, co convey anything to DESA, and we always, we do have Dennis and Wyman, who are always listening in, in any case. So, yeah. mm. Additional thoughts and comments? Christine. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Christina Aida, um, from the Egyptian government, former um, host of uh, the IGF. Um, so, um, since I'm just taking the floor today, I'd like to thank Japan for all the preparations, and I'm uh, sure it is going to be uh, one great IGF this year. Um, so, it's interesting to hear uh, uh, what Art just uh, mentioned, because it looks to me that there are so many um, discussions on WSIS Plus 20, but also on the GDC that happened within the ITU, um, uh, let me say, um, meetings, uh, some of them happened at the plenipotentiary, some of them are actually happening across the road to this week um, uh, at the council, and it looks to me as if there is no, nothing coming back from the IGF community back into uh, the ITU. So I've been attending um, uh, the open consultations for many years. We always have someone from the ITU uh, come um, to the open consultation, give us a briefing, and uh, it's, it's very good. I think it's very informative. We also have very active participation from all those different organizations at the annual IGF, also uh, sometimes used to be at our MAG meetings. Uh, but I don't think we have the other way around. So um, looking at the liaison might be a very important thing. So thank you for bringing that up, and uh, I think that's a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you.
other ideas? Uh, UNESCO. UNESCO. Uh, hello. Yep, hey, hello. You sound great. Uh, hi, my name is Tatevik Gregorian, and I'm new to the community, and um, I'm the new focal point for UNESCO's Internet Universality Romex Indicators, uh, which is ongoing in five continents. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm coming in late as I was checking if uh, Maria Elsa was here. Um, very briefly, I would just like to underline and uh, express our appreciation for the long-standing uh, excellent cooperation between ITU and UNESCO and the successful WISIS forum uh, this year. And uh, I would like to express our satisfaction for the inputs we received by stakeholders at the latest WISIS forum, both on the WISIS Plus 20 review and also on the Global Digital Compact. And I would like to re reiterate UNESCO's uh, Member States General Conference resolution asking to ensure a leading role in the WISIS Plus 20 review with a view to respond to the new urgent challenges brought by ICT transformative technologies within our area of competence. And uh, just to update that, as requested by our member states, UNESCO is preparing a consolidated WISIS Plus uh, 20 roadmap uh, in alignment with the grid United Nations reporting mechanisms on WISIS outcomes. Um, and the roadmap will be discussed at the upcoming UNESCO 42nd General Conference in uh, November this year. Um, and in view of this, uh, UNESCO is also considering holding a bigger conference in February 2025, uh, but, the, uh, but the context will be, uh, of course, uh, finalized and formulated. This is just a brief uh, update from our side. Thank you. And thank you. Yes, I heard with pleasure from uh, Pritam uh, before that there will be at uh, the next WSAS uh, conference uh, by the main conveyor of the WSAS. I wonder if we have to do something together, WSAS and, w and IGF, uh, reflecting on our common future. We can have something like this in, uh, already in Kyoto, and then we can have a second round at the next WSAS next year. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Thank you. Any other comments on the phone? Well, then. We can, can dispense with that topic. Our next topic is continuous improvements. What do we do in 2023? And um, it's a discussion about outputs and outcomes. This is, in that sense, it's an extension of what we've just been having. Um, but I, if we could basically focus on uh, the ideas that uh, that can can work towards implementing some form of of uh, interest intersessional event, um, intersessional idea intersessional ideas, different ways to think about new topics that come up, um, and a general discussion of overall improvements beginning with uh, next year, at the end of this year. There must be some ideas there. Is anyone online? And also, um, we can also just um, look at the, uh, the outputs that we had last year. Should we keep them the same? Are there any suggestions for improvements? Um, 
we have the IGF uh, 2022 outputs, which you can find on our website if you just go at the bottom of the page where you see um, IGF um, Addis Ababa, just click on that link uh, uh, all the way down. All the way down. Um, yeah, um, IGF Addis Ababa, thank you. And then we go down a bit. Wait, not all the way, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. So we have the IDF messages, which um, we have. Um, it, was the format okay? Do you have any suggestions to make improvements of that? That's one question. Um, the best practice forums, um, the outputs from the best practice forums and the PN, well, those outputs, fine. Um, and then we also have the additional outputs, like the summary report um, that you can click and um, find. You can also have the outputs of the uh, Global Youth Summit. We did have a um, daily bulletin. I'm not too sure whether or not we'll be able to have a daily bulletin this year. Uh, that's still under discussion. We did have it last year because the facilities were there and um, they were in the habit of producing um, daily bulletins. That's what um, we had it. And also, if you have any comments on media, how we interact with the media, the press events that we have. Um, last year, we also had some press events um, for notable people, and we scheduled them to meet the press. Uh, do you have any feelings or feedback on that, and yeah, uh, participation statistics. Those are very useful. Uh, you can take a look at them. Do you have any comment on that as well? Um, maybe somebody has an idea how they can be better presented. I don't know. I mean, any ideas come from any corner? Uh, Carol, please. <laughs> Thank you, Carol, um, government of the Bahamas. I forgot to introduce myself previously. But um, I found that the outputs are very useful in the uh, last couple of uh, weeks, months. I've had to go back to those to write reports um, for the government itself. Uh, I think in some instances, they need a little bit more meat. Um, I don't know exactly what. They were very... Um, I don't know, high level, but I suppose it's because it's so much. I, I don't have any suggestions of how to improve that, but just to comment that they are very useful. Um, so the report was very good, and because I knew that I could go back to the, um, the, to the IGF uh, website and click on the links that had the outcomes from the workshops, it was pretty good. Now, some of the um, persons that led the workshops, they did not really give a complete or comprehensive report. So that's probably something we need to, to look at, that we ensure that the reports are there and that they are comprehensive. I think Jorge was first. So, um, yes, sorry. Um, Jorge Cancio, Swiss government, for, for the record. Um, and thank you for, for breaking the ice uh, yourself, uh, Cengitai. That was useful that you oriented us a little bit on, on what you were referring to with IGF continuous improvements. I have some comments on that. Um, as you know, the, the messages started here in 2017, so they are very dear to us, to the Swiss government, and we think they are a very useful uh, communication tool for the IJF community, but uh, of course there, there can be improvement always. And one of the improvements I think we, we saw this year with the Addis messages is the formatting that uh, was done by the leadership panel itself with your help, of course. 
So I think uh, we can get inspiration from that format because it uh, um, provided or it rendered the IGF messages in a more crisp, more, more uh, uh, in a fashion that, that, that is uh, easier to, to read and to, to understand. So that on, on the format, we, we can build on that. And uh, one question that I think uh, uh, also I, I just chatted with, with Ross, we were going to ask is, okay, we, we have the leadership panel. Now, last year, it uh, was just recently uh, being established. Uh, so they didn't have really the, the time to have a big communication plan. And we've seen now that they've done, uh, amongst other things, this uh, reformatting of, uh, of the ADIS messages, which was very useful. But uh, what is the communication plan? How do they reach the, the uh, I don't know, uh, level 38 of the UN uh, in uh, New York? Uh, how do you, they go to the UN Secretary General and present the messages? Or how do they go to the General Assembly or to the high level political forum and present the messages? Uh, how do they present them to, to other institutions? Because it's not only the UN, of course. So that, that could be interesting to, to know in order to, to really get the, the messages to to the places where they have to be heard. And that was one of the, the main roles for, for the leadership panel, according to their terms of reference. And uh, then perhaps uh, beyond uh, what I uh, mentioned before of uh, getting inspiration on the leadership panel's format for the Kyoto messages, I think it would be very useful to do two very specific things. As we are continuing to discuss the GDC uh, themes, uh, basically, in, uh, in Kyoto, um, it would be uh, very useful to build on what the Addis messages already said, so that we don't reinvent the wheel that uh, all workshop organizers, all main session organizers really have the Addis messages before them and they can build on that. They can structure their questions around that in order to, to have some added value. And connecting this again with how the GDC process is going, uh, I think that the issues paper that will be presented at the ministerial by the co-facilitators will be very relevant. And uh, it will uh, be, in a, in a way, built on the consultations uh, that they have been having, the, the deep dives, and also the, the member states' reactions. Um, so it will be quite significant, probably more significant, than the policy paper prepared by the tech envoy, because that's just the secretariat point of view. And uh, therefore, my suggestion would really to ask all the organizers of sessions to have a look at the relevant portion of uh, the issues paper of the co-facilitators. If there are open issues there, or there are issues for discussion to really tackle those so that we have uh, IGF Kyoto messages that first build on what we already discussed in Addis and second are directly, uh, directly relevant to the political discussion as they will take into account what is in the issues paper from the co-facilitators. So I think that's quite handy, quite practical, and a way of uh, continuing to innovate uh, how we uh, build more relevant, more visible 
more um, tangible at outcomes. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jorge. Um, just on your questions about the leadership um, panel and uh, contributions, I trust that you will be there on um, Thursday morning, correct, uh, with the joint MAG meeting and leadership panel meeting as well. And um, on the leadership panel page uh, on our website, uh, there is um, Group A. Um, from the leadership panel, they formed a couple of groups. So group A is on awareness raising and outreach. And um, there, there is some summary reports on the meetings that they have. So you'll be able to get an idea of um, what they're working on because that was um, one of their questions. And of course, um, on Wednesday and also on Tuesday evening, you'll be able to talk to them as well and have an exchange of ideas. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Bruna. Really briefly, um, I think in terms of the messages, I actually agree with a lot of every, uh, the folks have been speaking about it now. I think the messages are good enough um, document in terms of the mess of the broader IGF conversation. I might have some comments on like making the language even more simpler than it is um, actually because it does make a difference in reaching out to a lot of the groups and stakeholders. But I do agree that um, the work the leadership panel has done afterwards was a good um, and relevant effort in making that message even, even simpler. But um, what I'm thinking is that the IGF this year can be seen also as an answer to the issues paper. So a lot of the things are going to be discussed there. So should the messages provide an answer to the issues paper? Will our discussions be kind of able to conduct like in-depth um, debates about the, the broader GDC issues paper? So just an idea because it would be good to have a small section there um, commenting exclusively on the broader GDC process and what the, the issues paper mean for us. and maybe kind of a collective vision for the summit of the future. So just a small suggestion. Thank you. Rita and, and then Bob. Thank you, Amrita, for the record. As in, um, I will not go into what Jorge and the others discussed because I agree with them. Um, my what I wanted to bring is how can we kind of try to mainstream the discussions at the IGF because it is not normally reported in mainstream news, unfortunately. As in perhaps we may want to look at how do we um, get the attention of mainstream media. Uh, for example, AI could be one such thing, you know, pick up the hot topic items and try to push it through media before so that they are interested in those discussions. Because one way is to build the narrative through the UN chambers and the government, but even getting mainstream media into the discussion may be something we may want to consider. We have journalists also, perhaps we can take their help. Thank you. And uh, Roz, you're up next. Oh, maybe she doesn't want? No. Nope. Okay. okay. Okay, Elisa. Thank you. Um, uh, so this is Elisa Eva for the record. Um, yeah, I would just uh, like to echo what, uh, what Jorge, uh, Jorge said about the, the messages. And in addition to his comments on the messages, I would like to ask if the Secretariat could say a bit more on how the messages are conveyed around the UN and, what, and the different stakeholder groups. Um, and what responses are you actually getting from uh, these other groups um, to the messages? Um, and also, um, um, online, are you, um, uh, do you keep track on how often the messages are downloaded or viewed on the web page of the IGF? Because that could also give us some insight in, well, how often people are, are looking to them, um, if that's um, 
um, over the years been a, a positive trend or if it's a downward trend. Um, I, I hope you're keeping track of this and, and I, I hope we can do some, something with, uh, with these statistics. Thanks. Thank you. Go on. Uh, Bart van Aatris. Uh, there were two questions I heard Shingetai and you, Paul, ask. I think on the first one, I saw the overview that you presented at the start, and there's nothing on dynamic coalitions there. We had 24, I think we had 30 this year, and we handed over a very important report to the MAC chair, and we found out that the Diplo Foundation does not even report on dynamic coalition sessions, so it's not in the daily report. We took our own picture and put it on our own website, but there's no mention on the IGF website beyond ourselves. So the question we've posed before is, is there a way to get dynamic coalitions that want to have their work recognized, to get it officially recognized, and what we have to do to make sure that we meet up with the, the criteria to be recognized. So that, that is one. I think that the fact that it's missing there in the messages is yeah, basically a missed opportunity for the IGF to show what sort of tangible outcomes we have. Second comment there is that at the own request of my colleague Dynamic Coalitions, I think our yearly report, they would love to have it published the day before the IGF next year, basically, because it's always postponed. But how can we ever become part of messages if our yearly report comes in the 1st of April or something? In other words, a half year after the IGF. So is that something that should be looked at by the Secretariat, that perhaps there has to be some more strict criteria there to be able to, to become part of, our me of the messages? Where content is concerned, I think that, uh, to, by coincidence, last Saturday, a friend of mine said, would uh, com quantum computing be part of your, your project? He doesn't know what it's called, but I talk about it sometimes. And he said that they're starting a whole set of, of workshops in the fall, but also he said that two of the four NIST, uh, what do you call them, uh, um, encryption standards that were presented last year have already been broken. And the, he expects that the next two will be broken pretty soon as well. So in other words, if somebody somewhere in the world finds out how to circumvent it, then all our online data is probably insecure within a second. So isn't that a topic that we would want to address in the IGF and see if we can come up with some sort of a policy guidance for the rest of the world? The second topic I mentioned in my, in my first intervention is on the public core of the Internet. So if the Internet standards that run the internet, which are the core of the internet, are not officially recognized and attacked 24 seven a day, the whole year round, then isn't that a topic that we could take on? And I volunteer my dynamic coalition to, to do so, but as we are working on it already, but it could also be a much wider topic in 2024. So let me stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, just responding quickly to Alisa's um, question about what we do with the messages and the report. Uh, last year we did um, both in Geneva and in New York, we did transmit the um, IGF 2023 report, which had the messages at the back as well with every, to all the missions. Um, here and in New York, and also to um, other sister organizations, UNESCO, um, um, OECD, etc. So those were sent. I know that, I'm so sorry, I don't remember if it was done um, for last year, but I can find out. We also do encourage the host country to um, submit that report to the General Assembly as well, um, so that it um, gets transmitted as far and wide as possible. Um, <laughs> My guest. 
Thank you for giving me the floor again. Jutta Kroll, Civil Society, former MAG member. Uh, we have been talking about the message now for a while, and I do think it's not only a top-down, but also we need a bottom-up approach. So that is up to all of us to, to make the messages heard. You know that I'm a children's rights advocate, and if I find something about child online safety and children's rights in the messages, and any presentation and speech I have afterwards, I would refer to the IGF messages and say, okay, also at the IGF it, it's recognized that this is an important issue and that we have to deal with it. So I think it's up to us ourselves to do something to make the, the messages more broadly heard. Thank you. As well, um, and we as well from, from, from our uh, point of view, when, when we're asked to write talking points, uh, we do include um, those um, references to the IGF messages, so both from the IGF Secretariat and also from UN DESA as well. So we do push those messages in every opportunity that we get. And as you to say, it is very important that you do the same uh, across the board. It's just not us, but everybody does that. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Roz Kenny Birch, UK Observer. I was just going to pick up on that excellent point. And I think, you know, we've talked about today the importance of um, taking up these recommendations, a, a bottom up, or sorry, messages, <laughs> a bottom up approach, all of that. And I definitely agree. I think one thing I would bring up as well is how useful these messages have been in terms of identifying upcoming or emerging issues and how useful the IGF as a fora for, is for that as well. Um, and the reason these are indeed messages is that so people can start to coalesce, start to talk about, bring attention to new and emerging issues. Um, and uh, have the freedom to explore these in a multi-stakeholder group. So I think that's also a really important tool of the messages as well, is again, not just looking um, at um, issues um, that have been ongoing or policy um, topics, but also in terms of um, new issues that might be coming to light as well. So thank you. Hello. You get the floor to me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, just two things um, to, to humble suggestion. One is about the documents. Um, I think that it is a lot more efficient and a lot more uh, possible to get um, a follow up if the messages are. Uh, targeting directly the people concerned. What I mean, for instance, there are the recommendations, but there are also the outcomes of the many seminars that we have every year about artificial intelligence. I think that a letter of the chair sent to, for instance, the various institutions, the various people that are working with artificial intelligence regulation could be more effective than sending uh, all the documents, all the recommendation of the IGF, because these people are narrow focusing on what is their need and their interest. So, if you send a letter specific saying, these are the outcomes of the IGF reflection on artificial intelligence, we know that we are working on that. Uh, we are even ready to, to join one of your next meeting to explain this more in detail. This would be more effective. I don't know if you are doing, if you are doing, sorry for saying again, but I think that this is the best way instead of sending to everybody, because we know that a lot of people, they, they focus only on certain points. About the media, as you know, this is a point on, that I always raise. It's very good that now we have um, availability of uh, big names for press point. Uh, the problem is that if we want the media participating, the part we need to, to know it very long in advance, at least uh, two weeks ahead of the conference, even more, um, that these people will be there in person and eventually available for interviews. If 
you publicize this to the to the newspapers, to the media, then people can organize themselves in participating and, uh, and being there in presence. If not, if they are not sure who will be there at least weeks in advance, nobody will plan uh, to send the journalists to, to cover the event. And they will stay home. In that case, you need to focus on these people in a different way, uh, trying to involve in eventually having a press point made online and inviting people to join this online press conference. But you need to work around it, as, as you know, as we have already discussed many times. Last point is, have you involved uh, NHK, the National Japanese Broadcaster? Because they are very keen, they are very good on technology, they have, uh, they have also reporting on technology very advanced. I think that uh, if you ask them to be involved, is the, the, as IGF, it's better if it comes from the IGF than from the government because uh, they are an independent body. I think that uh, they could be involved and they could, could give a big help in media coverage. Thank you. Yes, my button is stuck. Sorry. Um, thanks. Giacomo, um, we will follow up on your uh, very useful uh, pieces of advice and um, we'll see if we can get into contact with NHK and we'll ask you for the contact people as well, um, but we will follow that up, thanks. I just wanted to give the opportunity if Marcus or Celine wants to comment on what's his, um, if you have any comments on what Walt said. Yes, and um, thank you, yes. Uh, well, we discussed dynamic coalitions in the dynamic coalition coordination group. Uh, Marcus Kuma speaking for the record. I'm co-facilitator co of uh, that work, the coordination group together with uh, Utah, who already took the floor. Uh, Wout's comment, I think, uh, deserves to be addressed. That is how dynamic coalitions can also find their way into the messages I think this is something we can discuss with the coordination group, but also with the secretariat, how to find the modality. Obviously, it's not automaticity, but I think uh, to find a way into the messages could be a, a, a valid way to explore, also to uh, draw attention to the substantive output uh, of the dynamic coalitions. The annual report is a different animal that is basically here to just to prove that dynamic coalitions have been active, but it is not uh, meant to be a substantive input in the outcomes. But we have to look into this, how we can actually orchestrate it to make sure that dynamic coalitions get sufficient and appropriate attention. Thank you. Mark. Yes, uh, hello, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mark Arvel, um, former MAG member. Uh, I'm a member of uh, UADIG Support Association and focal point on UN processes in particular. And uh, I'm a special advisor to the ISCC Dynamic Coalition. So uh, just on that last uh, Point of accreditation, I very much welcome uh, Marcus's comments there that we should take forward about uh, proposal uh, about um, integrating uh, dynamic coalition uh, outcomes into into messages uh, and more broadly into IGF outcomes. But my main point uh, for joining uh, intervening uh, you at this moment is about the messages. Uh, these are so important. Um, and we found this in Eurodig, uh, where we devised the mechanism of messages uh, uh, earlier than the IGF did. Um, but uh, they, the messages establish uh, uh, and put on clear, concise record terms the, the scope and um, focus of uh, the IGF uh, and its um, deliberations, the extent to which they uh, address challenges, opportunities, and um, uh, emerging issues, stuff that's coming down the track. So they're so important and maintaining their visibility uh, 
is, is critical, as I think has been said uh, already and has been uh, discussed in, in the chat. And, um, and I would also emphasize the value of uh, having some follow up uh, during the year. And uh, there was a suggestion uh, by Henriette in the chat that some kind of uh, round table events might be uh, devised for engaging relevant fora, including UN agencies and so on, about uh, the messages. Uh, and I think that's a valuable uh, proposal. It uh, does ensure some critical visibility. And also, it's, it's a way of um, testing this sort of temperatures about their impact. You know, the IGF is important. Um, as a non-decisional forum, but which helps to shape policy decisions elsewhere. And uh, you know, the impact of the messages needs to be uh, uh, assessed uh, I, I, you know, without too much resource uh, uh, implications of that, but some kind of um, testing, you know, what is the impact of these messages? Um, who is, you know, to what extent are governments and the private sector and the technical community taking account of these messages? And I think there are ways of doing that. And the national and regional IGS also provide an opportunity, I think, for assessing at the local level what the, what the messages at the global level from the IGF uh, really mean for them uh, in, uh, in addressing a lot of issues and opportunities and responding to new technologies. So I think that that's, that's important. And the other aspect of this, which I think is, is was, was considered, I think, by Jorge in his uh, very helpful contribution, in that, um, you know, first of all, we don't want to sort of, you know, create a situation of duplication through successive IGFs. And also, uh, I, I come back to, I think it was the proposal of the high level panel on digital cooperation that um, the IGF institutes some kind of uh, multi year strategy and, and the messages can help inform the development of a multi year strategy for the IGF. Uh, to take forward, you know, in considering a message from one IGF, now how can that be taken forward? What further work needs to be done? at the next IGF, you know, that the messages provide that sort of hook uh, to determine what strategically the IGF should be doing on a specific issue. Having had one opportunity, what do we do, what do we do next as a global stakeholder community? So I, 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 I suggest that is also taken into account in uh, assessing and how to use the messages both for the IGF community and for the outreach to uh, wider stakeholders, uh, communities that are not directly involved in the IGF. Okay, I hope those suggestions are helpful. Thank you. Serena. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry, Natalia. No, I have two comments in two kind of different capacities. Uh, first of one, responding to what was said earlier about dynamic coalitions. At the form, as a former um, IGF secretariat consultant, we always looked at reports from dynamic coalition sessions to reflect in the messages. So let us just be clear that dynamic coalitions are reflected in the messages, not as a separate whatever portion there, but um, their outcomes are surely they're part of the overall messages. Um, and now with my other hat, Diplo Foundation, just we're talking about IGF outputs, but it's not only messages. There is such a lot of knowledge out there. We have session transcripts, we have um, recordings, we have reports from all sorts of sessions. We have outputs from the parliamentary track, the youth track, dynamic coalitions, best practice forums and everything else. Um, and since we talk about artificial intelligence, why don't we look into how to actually leverage this technology and look into all this um, wealth of knowledge and build on it and actually show how the IGF has been doing a lot of work in all these years, but in a more um, 
I would say, in-depth way than just the messages, which sometimes just scratch the surface. So yeah, the message is just short. Let's try to see how we can use artificial intelligence and um, build on all this knowledge and have IGF contribute to all other processes and happy to discuss with the Secretariat and with interested um, organizations on how we could possibly do this. Um, and yes, at Diplo, we have been experimenting quite a lot with um, AI tools. We have an AI reporting, an AI summarizing um, tool, um, and yes, happy to discuss how we can actually leverage all this for the benefit of the IGF and uh, the broader community. Thank you. Nicholas? Yes, hello everybody, Nicolas Fimarelli. Uh, well, I'm part of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance for the Latin American and Caribbean region, co-coordinator of Youth Lack like IGF and coordinator of Youth IGF Uruguay. Uh, firstly, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for your tremendous work with the website, uh, with all involved, the dedication and, and the commitment to improving the Internet Governance Forum every year. Um, as we gather here today, I, will, I would like to put forth uh, three concrete recommendations. Uh, the first one, uh, we are trying to use for a seamless start to the platform from day zero with no technical issues or website downtime. Uh, that will be desirable. We also recommend individual Zoom registration links to prevent Zoom bombing uh, and stricter security settings. You know that allow only moderators and speakers to share the screens. That is just one factor. The second recommendation is to advocate for an optimal use of artificial intelligence tools, as mentioned, uh, such as AI note takers, but also automatic transcription and translation for the Zoom meetings. This is really helpful, for example, for sessions that are focused on, on a region, for example, just to mention the lack analyzed space that we used to have. Uh, we always need to speak in English because it's a day zero meeting, but what will happen if we use this automated translation uh, feature? Is, is that it? Are you finished? If so, thank you very much. I'd just like to point out, uh, it's been kind of like a little bit of a struggle about um, the balance between ease of use and security, because with also with the security, there's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through to make sure that everything is secure, you know, individual links, Oh, is that just the feedback of my voice? Oh, maybe it's, I'm not too sure. Um, so, and, the, and we, you know, so we've had this yeah, user sorry, frustration and like, also um, the, the need for security, because of course we definitely do not want any of those Zoom bombings and things of that going on. Yeah. So it's an ongoing um, debate and um, ongoing effort um, from our part and Lewis's. Um, yeah. And yes, we're quite willing to, discuss with you as well to see what are the best practices and the way we can go forward. May, may I mention my, my last yeah. recommendation is very short. It's like we propose that all sessions, we, we, you mentioned dynamic coalition, but also lighting talks and smaller discussion to be considered in the ICF messages because we want that every contribution because of the multi-stakeholder model works like this uh, to enrich our collective understanding. That, that was the last recommendation. Sorry for broken your speech. Oh, no, Thank that's you. fine. And, and that's a good recommendation as well. And I think we do try and do that. But um, yes, um, th thank you for that. Yes. Henrietta. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, just a quick um, final um, input from me on this. I think there is one message that I've not heard us address yet. And that is that the IGF does not deal with internet governance in a narrow manner. And um, we probably don't mention this because we, we, we take it for granted. But if you look at the policy brief that emerged from the Tech Envoy and the GDC preparatory process, the Global Digital Compact and Summit of the Future, it, it reflects the IGF as a forum that deals with internet governance issues in a narrow sense. 
Um, the reality is, that if you look at the IGF agenda for the last 10 years, it, it deals with broader digital uh, issues um, from artificial intelligence, you know, to content gover governance, to security and, and capacity development. So I think that's a message that we probably should um, make very clear in, in the coming period, that overarching message about the depth and the broadness um, about uh, of the IGF agenda and that it's not just internet it does in fact uh, address digital governance in a broader sense and I think it's important because in the high level panel on digital cooperation report when the idea of the IGF plus was first proposed it was proposed from the from the perspective that the IGF has moved into broader digital issues and now there seems to be a bit of a misunderstanding emerging from the GDC process of the IGF as being a, a more narrowly internet uh, limited um, forum which it's not so just to suggest we include that in messaging thank you I don't know if Ross is that's an old one. Is that a legacy hand or yeah? <laughs> Anyone else want to make a contribution? Uh, hello. Uh, yep. My name is Marta. I'm from Mexico. Uh, uh, my recommendation is about the AI chat box. That is uh, currently we uh, we are using uh, and the web page that if we going we if we um, usually going to shopping on the online, but usually that AI box are well regulated because sometimes are very generic generic answers. That can take a whole decision when you are doing a kind of shopping or depends on the need of the, 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 the person. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, B. Uh, we have Olivier, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, online. Your hand is up. I don't know if you want to say something. Hey, anyone else? Bob? Thank you, Paul. Uh, Bob Tenatus. I'm coming back to Henriette's comment that we as Internet Governance Forum have moved beyond just simple internet for, for yeah, as long as I'm around. That's 2009, and I know there are people that are around longer. But what if we say that we are the digital cooperation forum or whatever it's called? The, the, the question is, what is the difference? And I've read the policy brief as well. And it is my conviction that if this DC whatever is going to be established, it's quite clear that the IGF will play a very second fiddle to it and will be narrowed to just internet, which we are not. So the question is about lobbying probably. And I heard Jorge say a lot of things, Ross say a lot of things. They are the people that could start this lobby, but perhaps other people in this room as well. And then the question is, what is it that the IGF wants to be in 2026? Because that is then what we're talking about. And that message will have to be start to be shared but pretty soon because it's 2025 before we know it. So thank you. Thank you. Any more online? Any more in the room? We're coming up on lunchtime. I think a lot of discussions we hear today about how we improve IGF is related to branding of IGF. 
if the messages is not getting across, if the media is not engaged, if all this activity, I think we should have you know, a serious look in how we brand um, the IGF. I mean, it's usually a technical offense. We are technical people. We focus on, on generating the value. But I think there is, there is another science need to go hand by hand on the branding of IGF, making sure that we follow the, the, the right branding. And, and it might be one of the future IGF where we uh, try to do a serious work in, in, in making sure that a branding experts will, will help us to position, position the IGF in, in, in the right place that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Abraham. Um, just following on, and not because of your intervention, I just want to say that um, most, if not all, of what we're discussing, we're not starting from zero. We're not saying there isn't any. It's all about improving that we should have more. And this is also some of the, um, the distractors of the IGF when they come to our um, open consultations and et cetera, they hear a lot of complaints, but it's not a lot of complaints. This is what we are welcoming so that we can improve. And it's not basically a criticism, it's just inputs for improvement. Um, so that's also, if we're looking at um, branding or taking into um, how people see us, we should also make sure that people do understand this, that these are all just discussions to improve what we have um, going on. And that is the whole intention of this, this continuous improvement process. Yeah. Yes. It's okay. Uh, Christina Arida, Government of Egypt. Uh, so, um, so when we talk about the branding of the IGF, I know there's been a lot of discussions that have, I, I think there was a working group, I'm not sure if it still exists, that talked about marketing and the branding of the IGF. Um, but the issue that was brought, brought up in, by Henriette in the chat and that uh, about also e echoed about digital governance and internet governance. I think it was discussed before, and I'm not sure if the IGF community has, at least from a community perspective, has the same um, feeling about that. I think it's something that is worth to be discussed. I know uh, the branding of the IGF itself should go uh, probably back to the, um, through the WISIS uh, plus 20 review because that would be a change uh, that needs to be, um, I mean, if it, if it is, I'm not voicing any opinion. I'm just saying that this is something that should be discussed. So if we're planning to discuss WISIS plus 20 and the relation to the future of the IGF, I believe it's important to have a discussion about digital governance and internet governance within uh, the community in a very open way um, in preparation within the community because if anyone is going to be uh, say what the IGF is, it will be the IGF community. Uh, and so we should put forward um, opinions that are discussed among stakeholders, among the different regions that the community may be able or not able to agree to. Just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, Mark Avell, um, UDIC. Um, member, IS3C policy advisor, uh, former member. Um, I just wanted to come in with regard to improving and strengthening the IGF uh, with regard to funding. If, um, if we're going to secure greater impact of the IGF, uh, support for more year-round outcome oriented activity, including for the dynamic coalitions like IS3C and policy networks and BPS. The IGF needs a, a firm, sustainable and predictable funding uh, base. I know this has been an issue 
that's been difficult for them for uh, many years throughout the history of the IGF. Um, some governments have been consistent in uh, contributing to the trust fund and there have been some private sector contributions, not many. Uh, IGOs have been contributing to, um, but I, I do not see uh, a strategy being developed for the funding model uh, to ensure that there are sufficient resources for expanding the secretariat capacity to support year-round activity, uh, such as, for example, uh, setting up round tables on the messages throughout the year that I mentioned in my previous intervention. This all requires resources. So is there a uh, prospect of an update at this meeting on the status of the funding of the IGF and also progress with developing the strategy? And I think the leadership panel has a role here for uh, securing more sources of funding, getting more governments to, uh, to step in and contribute, more uh, private sector contributions to the, the communities that are going to uh, benefit from the IGF you know, and those members of the community that uh, uh, are able to contribute in, to some degree uh, to the trust fund. Uh, you know, I don't think that outreach for support has been fully um, um, considered and how to how to generate more income so so my question is really uh before you all go to lunch um to think about is uh you know what how can the strategy for securing sufficient resources financial resources for the igf be uh developed and accelerated in good time ahead of uh, the business plus 20 review and so on thank you Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, as far as the leadership panel is concerned, yes, they do have a group that is, um, which is headed by Vince, um, that does look into um, the funding, and also Lisa Fur, um, is also quite active. Um, so they'll be meeting on Thursday and Friday. So. Uh, at the end of that meeting, I will also ask if they, if they have a plan that they could share, and that would help. Uh, we do, of course, always keep um, as up to date within a month of the funding situation on our website, and that can always um, be looked at. And then, of course, there's also um, the... Um, donors' meetings um, that we have. Um, but we do try and um, give out this information and also ask for ideas as um, widely as possible. Uh, but thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone waiting to make a comment or intervention? If not, we're at lunchtime. And uh, our lunch time is into 15 CST. So, without further ado, I'll adjourn us for lunch.
Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a good lunch. We're going to convene again. And for this session, I'm going to introduce Marcus Coomer, who I'm sure most of you know already, uh, who's going to run through um, some intersessional work on uh, internet governance and he'll be uh, joined with speakers that uh, he will introduce as they go along and uh, so without any further ado I'm going to vacate this chair and turn it over to Marcus thank you Paul and good afternoon everybody uh, let me briefly introduce uh, the event we have talked about it in Vienna, where the DC has made the proposal to have an intersessional event to discuss all the various components of the intersessional, let them discuss among themselves and to discuss how better to cooperate. Many speakers this morning highlighted the importance of all the intersessional activities, but the IGF was not just an annual meeting, but really worked all year round. They are various components of the IGF ecosystem. I mentioned the DCs, but they are also the best practice forums. Obviously, the NRIs all over the world, the national and regional initiatives, uh, the best practice forums, and the policy networks. And they work all year round on different issues. And many people have said it would be great if they actually worked better together to create synergies and we tried on various occasions also with the BPFs for instance BPF on cyber security to work with the NRIs invited them to calls but it never really took off so we thought it would be good to have a session devoted to this precisely how to better cooperate and how to work together to create synergies and to enhance the outcomes of the IGF. Now, how to approach this? We, early on, we sat together with the Secretariat and it was clear, a purely procedural session, how best to cooperate would not really work and that would be actually rather boring. So we thought it would be best to take an approach to look at the substance and we thought we take the eight my main themes identified by the MAG at the Vienna session and see whether we can form working groups of all the various components of the intersessional work, DCs, NRIs, BPFs, PNs, and see whether we could form working groups and see what they could come up together with as an input. And this session here is also seen as an input all these components, uh, intersessional components, might provide to the MAG when discussing what main sessions to have at the annual meeting. So we created, we tried to create eight working groups based on the eight themes. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't quite it, make it to have eight working groups. We it, it came up with six working groups, and we have them here up on the screen. Now. The reason why six and not eight is also there were some mishaps, some miscommunication, and there was very little time available. And above all, it was an experiment, and we do understand that everybody is very busy and we rely on voluntary work, so it's not always easy. But nevertheless, we come up with six working groups, so we will organize the session in two uh, clusters first three groups, we have them one after the other presenting their findings, then we open up for Q&A, and then we go back to the next group. We have three more working groups with three more themes, and then the same with Q&A. And we hope that will provide an interesting input, and we hope to have an interesting discussion, and we also hope that you ask relevant questions. In terms of organization, we uh, will give 10 minutes max to the presenters and we'll be very strict. Uh, Celine will present the slides and she can rush you through if she thinks you're too slow. And we will 
uh, cut you off, if, or give you a warning before cutting you off that you have to come to a closure. And with that, uh, then we give the first uh, work, and some of the presenters will be uh, presenting remotely. And the first one is on digital divides and inclusion. And that is, uh, that is Ponsole, who already talked uh, this morning. Uh, Ponsole, are you online? Yes, and I am online. Make your presentation, uh, yeah. please. Selena, I'm ready to go when you are. Thank you, everyone. As you can see from um, this group on, uh, on digital divide and inclusion, um, we have a lot on inputs, we have a lot on impacts, and I think um, basically I'm not going to go through um, all, all the inputs and impacts, but things that are very um, and key that comes uh, um, um, from the top of this um, group was um, affordability, access to tools, language, and of course, um, content um, availability. When we talk of access and speed reliability, we are basically talking of um, meaningful um, access in that sense. And of course, the impacts are all um, go with um, the inputs if they're achievable. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay. What some of the key principles um, in, uh, for addressing inclusion includes um, time to recouple connectivity and meaningful connectivity. We need a um, systemized evidence gathering and, and synthesis to, to, to inform policy. We need to take a design thinking approach considering better the needs of people with disabilities, which is very key in what this group is looking at and adopt standards. When we talk of standards, that's standards that really go with a good design thinking approach. We need to focus on goals, not just profitability. How can we use new tools to achieve the goals? And that, that also intends working a lot with the telcos and other stakeholders that um, sometimes, in most cases, focus on profitability. Ensure that the public-private partnership and deliver and that we safeguard digital goods, including infrastructure. We need to be ready to take the perspective of pre-existing development actors and think how the internet can enable them. And that basically goes with a lot of the things inputted in the um, digital corporation. Next slide, please. Okay, key priority um, actions was one to intensify our work to gather examples structured around real world needs and present them in ways that fertilize debate and inform policy. Basically, it goes down to looking at it from a bottom top approach, because at the end of the day, when you look at the digital divide and inclusion, it's usually people at the um, bottom of the fabrics of our various communities that are affected. Provide training on access accessibility so that we model good practices build consensus around definitions of meaningful access and ensure that these include reference to a variety of forms of connectivity, judge the internet and digital technology on whether it is delivering on development goals such as health, jobs, education, and participation, basically aligning it with the SDGs, ensure that we focus on how to use tech to devil an internet for all and engage a, a wide, wider range of actors and policy fields. We know where which actors we have to target. Earlier on in the morning, people talked of getting the business community more in, in, involved in fundraising and other things. And I think it makes them understand policy issues to work with government. Next slide, please. OK, we have um, um, the various um, dynamic coalitions that we have to focus on the dynamic pollution on the Internet of Things, the dynamic pollution on accessibility and disability, the dynamic condition on digital health, the dynamic pollution on Internet and jobs, the dynamic pollution on public access in libraries, and the policy and network on meaningful access, which is a, a very, very key in my mind. Next slide, please. So, Yes, I think um, 
That was the last slide mentioning our dynamic collisions. I think I tried to do it under the 10 minutes um, mandate. If any of my colleagues on that particular working group want to chip in, I think we still have some four minutes. They can go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much and also for sticking to the time. But I think we rather stick just to one presenter, otherwise it gets a little bit too complicated. And your colleagues can always come in in the uh, discussion afterwards. Anyway, many thanks. And uh, you also, in one point you highlighted for people with disabilities that has been with us was one of the very first dynamic coalitions dealing with accessibility for people with disabilities, which is, that has been a, an issue that has been with the IGFs right since the beginning. I see a comment in the chat from Sivas making, questioning why do we have public-private partnership terminology. It's a traditional idea of business working closely with governments, which always has caused imbalances. I would also say it's a very much a terminology that was popular back in the 90s. And I would say with the IGF, we have to a large extent replaced that terminology with multi-stakeholder cooperation and multi-stakeholder approach. But once again, Ponsolet, many thanks. So we come to the next presentation. And if I understand, that's the Working Group on Cybersecurity, Crime and Online Safety. And that is Wout, correct? Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Marcus Valtinatus, on behalf of several dynamic coalitions and the best practice from cybersecurity. Um, next slide, please. Well, it's not on yet. There it is. Thank you. Um, cybersecurity and safety has been an important topic at the IGF from the very beginning. And it seems to become ever more important with, with each next IGF. And without ad adequate cybersecurity, trust in the use of the internet erodes rapidly, and society will not be able to reap the benefits that otherwise would have been within reach. In 2022, uh, 23, sorry, it's in the top of session proposals, and this is reflected in the interest for the intersessional event. The IGF's theme is the internet we want and by far most people and organizations want it to become safer and more secure, including more secure and safer by design. And what role can the IGF play in enhancing justified trust in the use of the internet? And what can be the intersessional work currently undertaken within the IGF contribute to the global discussion as well as provide concrete and practical guidance? Several intersessional activities are dedicated to aspects of cybersecurity and safety. For example, the BPF cybersecurity and the dynamic coalitions on internet things, of things, internet standards and security and safety and the data-driven health technologies, DC. Their work has resulted in or will result in reports, good practices, guidelines, and or toolkits, which are announced in the annex to this presentation. The outcomes presented by them at the IGF will vary from global policy comparisons, including recommendations on best practices. It will include toolkits and guidelines for a diverse set of stakeholders. But we decided not to focus on the content too much, but more on the process. So what is the goal of this presentation at the more general level? More, next slide, please. I think that what is important is that intercessional work is recognized as an IGF tangible output. And that is the goal of this e event to show that that is a reality within grasp. So we could, for example, provide a good overview of what work that is going on and has been done within the different IGF communities. And to assess what lessons have been learned and what conclusions can be drawn from failure and from success stories in regard to cybersecurity and safety. What about stimulating breaking down of the silos within the IGF and to work across these communities where and when relevant and to benefit from complementary where possible? To create synergies between IGF workshops, between other sessions and main sessions and the IGF intersessional works in the BPFs, the PNs, the DCs and with the NRIs that will allow us all to build upon each other's work and avoid duplication and repetition. 
And finally, identification of and stronger IGF messages that are supported by a broader base of IGF communities. But what is the goal where content is concerned? Next slide, please. Again, that intercessional work is seen as an IGF tangible output. And then it's important to understand the difference between security and safety, but also to understand where and how they become interdependent as both are important for the trust in the internet and online applications. That the MAC, the leadership panel and the tech envoy have full knowledge of the existing body of work produced by the IGF intercessional activities carried out by definition in a multi-stakeholder way. That they are aware of the ongoing activities and what output to expect by the Kyoto meeting so that they can A, use IGF intercessional work when planning for the IGF 2023 meeting and the, beyond, B, raise awareness on the influence of the IGF more effectively and C, point directly to its achievements and tangible outputs. So our suggestion is to discuss and coordinate potential future work together. If we can agree upon that, then we will be working together beyond our silos. And to discuss how we move from theory, a nice digital report on the IGF website, to practice and deploy the recommendations and guidelines, for example, by coordinated outreach. And finally, to make the distinction between advising on and or pointing out the threats posed by the internet and the guidance and toolkits on how to improve cybersecurity and safety and that the IGF is delivering them. So here I will stop on the general uh, presentation and add one thing as IS3C, that we are willing to discuss with the MAG to fill in our work. But in response to that, start a discussion how our work will get official recognition as that it becomes an IGF report that we are willing to actually do parts of the outreach, which we are doing already, but it also needs to be clear why we are doing that. That is not an obscure part of the IGF nobody heard of, but that it is a part of the whole system. So our invitation is to have a debate on this and see if that is within grasp or whether it's impossible, but then we know. And I think this intercessional uh, meeting definitely contributes to the awareness where actually our intercessional work at this point in time is. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation and also for being concise and within the timeline. Uh, we have one more working group before we open up the floor for discussion. That's on global digital cooperation, and the presenter will be Conchettina, or Titi, as she's known in our community. Are you online, Titi? Yes, I'm online. Thanks, Marcus, for giving me the floor. My name is Titi Cass. I work for Agit, Italian government, and I'm a former MAG member. So uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity to organize this intersessional uh, event on uh, global uh, digital uh, cooperation. Um, next slide, please, Celine. <laughs> okay, so this uh, part is intended to just reflect on, on, the, on all uh, the action that the IGF has made in this, uh, uh, this year since uh, the beginning on uh, global digital governance and cooperation. And um, as you know, the EGF was created as a, an innovative process to bring uh, stakeholders together to discuss uh, internet governance issues and the policy uh, challenges. And one of the most uh, um, challenge was actually the global digital governance and cooperation. That this uh, was, uh, was a, an important uh, uh, um, challenge discussed uh, since the beginning by the IGF uh, with, with an agenda that has been driven by stakeholders and also uh, that covered a lot, a broad range of, of issues. And um, we, we also need to reflect on how the IGF has evolved in, this, uh, in these years, because now it's not just the annual event, but uh, it encompasses a lot more the intersectional activity as the best practice forum, the policy networks, the dynamic coalition. 
And all uh, these uh, activities are convening stakeholders to exchange experience and discuss uh, uh, subject matter best practices. And also, an important uh, element of the IGF is the National Regional Youth uh, IGF that includes more than 150 uh, initiatives that uh, foster multi-stakeholder multi discussion on internet policies issues and, and that have an important relevance at the national, regional and youth level. Next slide, please. It's also important uh, to reflect on how uh, the IGF has introduced in the last five years new processes. First of all, the leadership panel, then uh, try to have a more focused agenda, the parliamentary track, and all these processes have been introduced to respond to the challenges and uh, the suggestions that have been uh, indicated by the UN Secretary General in the high level panel of digital cooperation and also in the roadmap for digital cooperation and, uh, and uh, in the Our Common Agenda report that includes the Global Digital Compact. All these initiatives that have been activated by the Secretary General are focusing on global digital cooperation as uh, it is the essential driver for designing a sustainable, open, secure digital future that is anchored in universal human rights and that is also uh, trying to pursue the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, I want to mention also that uh, all uh, a lot of several uh, intersectional activities, the Dynamic Coalition, the Policy Network, the NRIs, they provide the feedback to the consultation on global digital compact. And also they have uh, uh, participated actively to the deep dive discussion that has been managed by the uh, co-facilitator of the global digital compact from Sweden and Rwanda. Just to mention some of the intersectional activity that contribute to the discussion on the global digital compact, uh, Euro, the Italy AGF, the Swiss AGF, uh, Uruguay, uh, the, the, the Iowa Coalition Community uh, connectivity. You can you can see you can read the list, but it's a very very uh, long uh, uh, list of uh, intersectional activity that contribute in a proactive way to all this discussion that have been started with the global digital compact, and then also uh, the policy network on internet fragmentation also is discussing. Uh, uh, avoiding and addressing the fragmentation on internet governance uh, and coordination as it considered one of the dimensions in, in its framework uh, for discussing internet fragmentation. And I want also uh, to add that um, in the organization of the annual event, also the NRIs have included uh, this topic in their agenda, as for instance, Eurodic, the last discussion that was held on Eurodic on GDC, and also Italy AGF and many other NRIs are focusing on, on this, uh, on this uh, um, topic. Next uh, slide, please. So now I want just to, to list some uh, points on which we could uh, reflect, we could discuss some question. Uh, the first one is uh, about uh, the IGF that has been addressing the discussion on including global digital governance and cooperation since the beginning. So maybe it could be important to collect your views and inputs on how DGF processes could contribute to, glo to improve global digital governance and cooperation and how this could be better discussed and reflect on the, on the IGF 2023 uh, agenda. Uh, another important point on which we could focus our discussion is uh, on the high-level panel of digital cooperation on the, on the roadmap for digital cooperation that uh, uh, both are suggested the introduction of new process in, in the IGF. And maybe you can contribute just suggesting and sharing idea on new mechanisms that um, could be introduced in order to have an IGF that is more impactful on the global digital governance and cooperation. 
another uh, um, element that came out from this uh, group was uh, referring was referring to the our common agenda report uh, as also uh, uh, in our common agenda report is suggesting that the IGF should continuously innovate and reform itself to adapt to the evolving of the digital landscape and um, this could include also exploring new mechanisms for engagement as uh, uh, such as incorporating emerging technologies and also facilitating a greater, greater youth participation. And one idea came from this group related to a citizen council within the IGF as an integral part of the global digital compact and um, as a way to further enhance the engagement and representation of different stakeholders, including the general public. So it could be useful to to see your idea and your consideration about uh, this uh, proposal. Next slide, please. So the last two points uh, were referring to the Our Common Agenda Policies B5 that is suggesting to convene an annual digital cooperation forum to support three-party engagement and follow up the implementation of GDC. So it could be useful also to reflect and to compare your views on the common elements between the Digital Cooperation Forum and the IGF. And uh, maybe also it could be useful to discuss how the IGF could be upgraded to implement the, the, digi the Digital Cooperation Forum. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And oh, right at the end, there is also a list of the members of the working group who have contributed to this presentation. Now, we thought instead of having all six presentations, one after the other, we make group, group it in two and we open up the floor for question comments uh, after the first three presentation. Anyone would like to comment? I think we all have seen, I think the main aim was actually to present how rich the work is of these uh, intersessional groups and there were also some comments uh, on this in the chat and one comment also made the point uh, Wim that is that also the work done in the past can also be useful can be used going forward it's, uh, it's a very rich uh, library by now we have of best practice forums policy networks which can also be used going forward who would like to comment Yes, Yuta, please. Yes, thank you for giving me the floor and thank you for the three presentations. Um, I, I have in my mind two important things. Uh, one is uh, while talking about assess the lessons learned from success stories and from failures. And second point was mentioned by Titi that the Internet Governance Forum should innovate uh, continuously, not only the format, but also the, the issues and topics we are talking about. And I, I got the impression that that is exactly the, the very nature of the Internet Governance Forum. Of course, we have been talking about a lot of these themes and issues from the beginning, but that was a different kind of Internet that, had, that we had 20 years ago. And this fast pace that the digital environment is evolving over that time needs to be paralleled by the Internet Governance Forum innovating its own structure. And that would make sense to discuss the same issues we've been discussing, like cybersecurity, for example, like we will see with human rights from the beginning. But we need to understand it differently from what we have been discussing 20 years ago. And I do think that it's, it's really good to have a continuous format with the Internet Governance Forum where we can discuss these evolving issues and address them appropriately from time to time. Thank you. Thank you very much for these thoughtful comments. Uh, it is true that quite often critics of the IGF say you always keep discussing the same issues, but they're not the same anymore because the technology has also evolved. And it's not so with the changing technology, what seems to be the same issue is not actually the same issue. 
other comments, questions? Yes, Chris, please. Uh, thanks, Marcus. Chris Buckridge, MAG member, apologetically taking the mic. Um, I, 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 well, first I want to thank all of the presenters um, that we've heard from so far um, for the information here. I think um, it, it definitely raises some important issues and questions. I'm uh, perhaps not quite understanding the format here. So uh, are each of these different working groups reflecting intersessional work that has been done or is ongoing? Um, or are they, or are the themes not necessarily related to that? I, I'm primarily, I'm, I mean, I sort of obviously see very strong link to Vout's work on cybersecurity, cybercrime, et cetera. I think the global digital cooperation issue and the themes raised are very important, but I wasn't really aware of any intersessional work being done there. I guess, but I guess I'm also not regarding, for instance, the work, MAG working group on strategy as intersessional work. So perhaps it's my own definition there that needs expanding. But I, maybe just if this is a possibility to explain a little bit more. It's, it's, it's a valid question. It's my bad. I should have explained it better. The idea was not that they present uh, work they had been doing, but rather that they take the eight themes defined by the MAG and see based on their experience of their past work, what would their thoughts be, their contribution, their input into the MAG discussion on these themes. So it's not reflecting past work necessarily, but obviously that was supposed to flow in into their thoughts. So they draw on their past experience. So the idea was really to, to bring the brains together to see what they come up with uh, with these eight broad themes. But as I said, it's my bad. I should have explained it better. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Uh, I don't know whether there was also in the chat uh, some... Oh, UK, please, yes. <laughs> Ross, please. Thank you. Um, Ross Kenny Birch, UK Observer. Um, just thank you so much for all three of those presentations. Really, really useful to get an overview there. And I wanted to pick up on the presentation on uh, digital governance and cooperation in particular. Um, I thought it was so good that you mentioned, uh, Titi, that how important it is to remember and reiterate that the IGF has since its inception explored how digital cooperation links can be improved and how that's been ongoing since the start. Um, there has been more of a greater focus on this, um, as mentioned in the presentation, uh, across the UN system with the Global Digital Compact. But I think it is really important to note that uh, the IGF's been at the locus of these conversations uh, since its inception. And um, the NRIs and policy networks are a particular testament to, the, uh, testament to this, uh, creating these groups and initiatives where all stakeholders, including in their local areas, can come together and share experiences um, has been a real way of helping to foster this cooperation um, at the grassroots level from the bottom up as well. And uh, the setup of the IGF is what allows it to continuously innovate. Um, the leadership panel has been creative, a new, created, a new policy network has been launched this year. And the IGF's real willingness, and by extension the MAG's real willingness to look at these new initiatives is a testament to its uh, bottom-up bottom structure, inclusive of all stakeholders. So I really just wanted to um, uh, point out those points from that presentation in particular, and really to say it's done a great job of highlighting, I think, some of where the IGF is so strong, um, to, been so strong to date. So thank you. Well, thank you for that. And uh, Judith has her hand up. She's remote. Uh, Please, Judith. Yes. Yes. Judith Hellerstein with the DCAD. Um, and I also wanted to point out to Chris um, that Stephen Weiber of the International Federation of Libraries held um, organize a survey for our little group and their responses. And I think he can share the responses, um, which were then used to create the word cloud and the other areas. But we had um, very detailed responses to uh, the survey asking questions about, um, did, uh, about in digital inclusions. And so 
it was, uh, that might also be very, and I would love if we could put that also into the record of the responses for that survey, because at least in the DCAD, we pointed out the issues of accessibility for persons with disabilities and about the problems of creating roadblocks in the way um, for that. And there's a lot of training capacity building that is needed to be done. Uh, and so we just wanted to make that point. Um, and one simple point also is, is that even in doing the slides for this presentation, we found out um, we we will became aware that the IGF comms team um, doesn't use accessible material for their slides. So it's always a learning progress, but that's also why we wanted to, to make sure that our points were heard. But thanks so much. I don't want to take too much of your time. Thank you. No, as I said, I think uh, right at the beginning, this issue has been with us from the beginning and the DCAD has made it tremendous contribution to make the IGF more accessible. So that is most welcome comments. Uh, and there were quite a few comments were addressed in the chat to uh, Titi. I wonder whether you would like to get back and react to some of the comments. Okay, Th thanks, Marcus. Uh, I, I, I see the comments from Henriette asking me what is uh, my view on, on this. Um, I think that uh, the experience of IGF is very important. The work that has been done in IGF is very, very important, the work on digital cooperation. So I think this should be uh, used, I mean, as input in the new uh, digital cooperation forum that uh, in some way, I mean, my visibility, my visibility is not so... Um, so good because I mean I, I read the document. There's some some uh, some details I think are, are missing on the digital uh, cooperation forum. So I think it's important mm -hmm. that to start this dialogue that could be um, driven by by, by the, the mag by the leadership panel in the IGF community in order to get more details on what are the role and function of the digital cooperation forum and also. Uh, to compare, I mean, uh, the main function of the IGF and the main function of digital cooperation form to understand if there is a, a really uh, some uh, uh, duplication in the function, the roles and the objective that they want uh, uh, to, 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 to reach. And um, at the end of this discussion, of this dialogue, it could be also be, um, I mean, uh, uh, included in, in the IGF uh, 2023 in Kyoto, for sure there will be some output and results uh, based on which we, uh, we could suggest to um, integrate, I mean, to have a more close co cooperation between these two forums, or otherwise we could suggest, also considering the USIS uh, plus uh, review, to review the mandate of IGF in order to better uh, create synergy between the three forums, maybe to upgrade the IGF uh, to have the same uh, function of the, of the digital cooperation forum. I don't know the result of the discussion, but I think this could be very useful. So I hope uh, I replied to the question in chat. I don't know if there is any, any other <laughs> question. Thank oh, you. Yes, I see him. Mark, uh, okay, sorry. Mark mentioned about the the Citizen Council. Okay, this was a request, um, a proposal that came from uh, Yao in the working group. So maybe Yao, if it is it joined, the, if it is available, maybe you can uh, just uh, share a few information on this proposal. Is Yao? It doesn't seem to the... be online. Ah, okay, oh. because uh, it was a proposal that came from him and then we shared uh, um, here. So I, I cannot, I'm not able to give all details to so Max, but maybe we can start a discussion via email with Yao that has suggested this, uh, this proposal. Thank you. And Wim, you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. I hope you, yeah, you can hear me. Um, you? I'm 
Thank you, Zella. I'm uh, supporting the work of the Best Practice for Cybersecurity and the Policy Network, for those that don't uh, don't know me, and have been involved in uh, supporting intercessional activities in the past. I wanted to uh, make like a general observation and take maybe a, a step back and go back to uh, Chris's question on uh, the importance or the relevance of, of this event. Um, I personally keep um, finding it very important to repeating and explaining uh, that there are those different modalities, best practice forums, policy networks, NRIs, uh, and that they indeed, they might be discussing the same topics, but they can do different things. And their approach, um, different people are different types of stakeholders, and they, uh, yeah, they, they work different and can achieve uh, different things also because they have different timelines. The policy network best practice forum is really linked to the um, to the annual meeting, while, uh, for example, the DC, I think, and then NRI uh, have uh, has, have their own uh, can have their own timeline. Um, I'm saying this because I always have the experience at an IGF meeting that for um, eighty percent, eighty five percent of the people coming to an IGF. The, inter the Internet Governance Forum is that one week a year, that one time event. And if they look at the agenda uh, and they see DC, they see uh, Best Practice Forum, they see uh, Workshop, they see Main Session, all they see is uh, 10 times exactly the same thing or 100 times, 200 times the same thing. A session organized with people, uh, with people uh, sitting on a panel. And I don't think that, uh, I still don't think that for that 80, 85% of, of people uh, coming to an IGF meeting, they really see this difference and they really see that there is something, there's other modalities that are working and can do different things. And uh, that's why I um, uh, I think it's, it's really important for uh, uh, to keep having this basic message and, and this basic explanation of and also towards to Mac members, to other people following. Uh, and then maybe one concrete, but we come back to uh, the presentation on the policy network later on uh, uh, after, well, in the next set of presentations. But uh, I must say, um, we already, thanks to organizing this event and having um, or have have been uh, sitting together with other intersectional activities focusing on similar topics, uh, we discovered that there is a DC uh, working on a topic that is, or, or has been doing work in the past on a topic that could fit well in, in what uh, the best uh, the policy network is doing this year. So uh, I think this is just a, a very small example, but it, it shows um, that the value or the importance of this meeting is not just at, at one layer uh, promotion and, and saying, but it also has a very practical angle, just knowing and uh, because sometimes we know what's what other people are doing, but uh, when you actually need or, or would need it, it's um, uh, you don't think about it. Just wanted to make those two uh, points. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I saw in the chat Segun, the former MAG member, and Nigel Casimir, the Secretary General of the Caribbean uh, at the telecom agency, asked the question, are we now talking not anymore about internet governance, but about digital governance? And that is an issue that was also being discussed uh, this morning, and I think it will be revisited uh, throughout this week. But Chris, you have your hand up. Um, thank you, Marcus, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, um, Wim, for that uh, that explanation. Um, sorry, Chris Buckridge, MAG member, um, and and sorry, and I realise I'm taking the floor a bit, but I'm hopefully yeah trying to to get a sort of move towards sort of um, get an understanding of what we're trying to get out of this session and and sort of get towards that. Um, and I'm coming from the perspective of someone who's on the MAG and isn't terribly involved in a lot of the intersessional work. Um, as I say, more in the MAG working group side of things, but I haven't been as intimately involved in driving a DC or, or other events um, as others here. So I'm certainly looking to all of you for, for 
expertise on that. Um, but I, I mean, I do think sort of from the perspective of the IGF um, that the intercessional work is incredibly important, as it is incredibly important in selling the value of the IGF, that it's more than just a sort of five-day event that we gather together for. There is actually practical work that can be done drawing on that community and using, using the sort of convening power of the IGF to, to do that. Um, and I think there are, there are great examples that we already have of that and that we need to be showcasing and talking about. Um, but I think what I am gathering from this is that there is a need that's perhaps already starting to be addressed but can go further to better coordinate the work that's going on and to better coordinate that perhaps with the annual event and the sort of work that's going on there. So one, one thing that sort of occurred to me, and I'm really just throw this out as a sort of suggestion to be shot down if it's not sort of addressing that. But for instance, as we look each year at developing the main sessions for the IGF, if there was a sort of timeline or something for DCs or any other intersessional groups to provide input, to provide feedback, to say, we've, been, we've done this research, as Judith was talking about there, and we think this is an important piece of research or piece of output that should be or would be useful in a main session. Um, would that be the kind of additional coordination that would be necessary or that would be useful? So, I mean, no promises made from the side of the MAG or the Secretariat or who's putting together the, the main sessions, no obligation on the DCs or others to provide something if they haven't had sort of significant outputs that year. But and an understanding that there is an opportunity there for intersessional structures, DCs, um, policy networks, BPFs, to provide that input and help contribute to shaping the sort of main plenary sessions of each year's IGF. Is, is that sort of in the right solution space there? Well, thank you for that. And that was definitely sort of the ultimate objective of this initiative, that we could actually draw on the wisdom of, of these various components and see what they can contribute and not. And I think it came up also in the chat, uh, it was sponsor led, uh, supported the idea of, I think Wout mentioned the silos and that was support, you know, break down a little bit the silos between the various components. Uh, there's also a comment Ariette made in the chat. I caught quite a bit of traction uh, on uh, asking for an assessment where the gaps are in the IGF's current scope. That had support with quite a few people. And Ariette also commented on the digital cooperation versus internet governance <laughs> definition. Uh, I don't know, Ariette, do you want to come in on both issues? Well, I can just say, I mean, Ariad says to Nigel and to Segun that it is a hard question. It, is it possible to put the fence around internet governance? Where does internet governance end and digital cooperation and digital governance begin? Her view is that they're so interlinked that it is impossible to separate them. But at the time, some issues or processes will need a stronger emphasis on the internet, whereas at other times, a stronger emphasis on broader digital governance. That's a very uh, scientific or diplomatic way. I will put it in much simpler term. It's the same. It's just more fashionable now. Everything is digital. Everything used to be E some 20 years ago. <laughs> then we had internet. But when we actually came up with a definition on internet governance, we talked in the early days about narrow definition and the broad definition. And we all agreed that we needed a broader definition that goes beyond the purely technical aspects, and we talked then, the, the working group on internet governance came up with a very broad concept of use and abuse of the internet, and uh, that included all cybercrime, and you name it, and also protection of children right from the beginning. And now it has all turned into the digital world, but we're still talking about the same thing. And shall we also remind the digital advocates 
but without the internet, there would no be digital cooperation. You know, it relies still on the same technology, and that is the very basic internet that brings people together. Other comments? Yes, Swout. Yes, the, I think this is better. <laughs> so I wanted to respond to you, the, Chris, but I think I'm not going to. <laughs> um, oh, thank you, Marcus. Um, I'm going to respond to, to Wim's comment and to, to Chris's comment anyway. But um, I think what Wim was saying is, has a lot of virtue. What we noticed, for example, last year at the IGF, when we had a day zero session on the Internet of Things and not mentioning the Dynamic Coalition, we draw over 100 people. And when the Dynamic Coalition has a workshop as a Dynamic Coalition, we had 10 people in the room, and all members. So what I suggested in Vienna, and I think that the Secretariat has taken that, all, has taken that up, is to not mention the BPF first or the Dynamic Coalition first, but come up with a compelling title, which is of interest to the world. And then somewhere beneath that would be BPF of PN or and that may attract more people because Dynamic Coalition sounds as, oh, I'm not a member, so why should I show up? So only members should tend to show up through the years. So that may be a way to change it and to break down a little bit of the silos. Coming to Chris's comment, I think that's an excellent example of what, what the options are, to, to actually coordinate between the different, the different blood types of the IGF. But another one could be you're deciding on workshops today and I'm uh, tomorrow sorry and the day after and I'm not going to be intervening there but it could be an idea if there are cyber security topics to say guys there's a BPF you have to take them on board if the topics are relevant the same with the DC on health or the DC on the internet of things and of course my own DC but there the, in that sense there would be coordination but also more synergies and that will break down silos and probably bring in more people into the intercessional work because then they understand that the IGF is not a one yearly event anymore but something that happens every year and that is the role that the MAC can take is something not something that I can do as an independent somebody or a coordinator so that's my invitation to the MAC to actually look at what we are presenting today take that back with you tomorrow and the day after and then come up with coordination what you could actually really be good at doing so thank you thank you oh, yes one after the other you first yes please thank you thank you very much and um, dino de lacho mag member for the first year representing the united nation united nation joint staff pension fund so I'm going to uh, make a comment that somehow anticipates what else I'm going to say later on uh, this afternoon. But I think that it's very relevant to what you just said now. And uh, I apologize in advance whether my uh, limited knowledge compared to many subject matter experts here may not be complete. So please correct me if I'm wrong. One of the things that uh, attracted my attention uh, since I became involved with the IGF and became a MAG member, and now looking at the, at the slides that have been presented. This morning, there was a very important distinction that I heard. Uh, at a certain point, uh, there was a question, observation vis-a-vis, -vis, okay, but what is the, the difference that IGF made throughout its history? And what did it produce? What are the tangible results? And I think Arnett or someone else uh, made a clarification and said, well, wait, wait a second. IGF is not an implementing entity. It's a forum where many stakeholders come and discuss and make recommendations. However, then when I look at the slides, I do still feel that there is this expectation to demonstrate something, to talk about result, to talk about outcomes, to talk about impact. So, and indeed, in the cybersecurity uh, proposal here, I actually know that the word deployment so not just about talking about recommendation, but also talking about maybe use cases of deployment or something that uh, is tangible. 
And also in the, in the, in the presentation that Titi made and the commentary that uh, followed the chat, there is a lot of discussion about what are the distinguishing element of IGF versus all these other broad uh, entities and bodies, the high level panel on digital cooperation, ITU, WISIS. So from, from being a newcomer here, I really think that there is a need for some sort of a Rosetta Stone, something that can compare and contrast what is the mandate of IGF vis-a-vis -vis all these other entities. In order to address then this question about Arnett made in the chat, and I think it was alluded to before, about are there gaps in the scope of the IGF? So my question is, and I apologize here again, I'm a former auditor, so by professional deformation, I always uh, reason in terms of input, output, impact, outcome, metrics, statistic, evidence. So my question is here, given that this is a multi-stakeholder body, every, everybody's represented. So ultimately, are we self-assessing ourselves or is the IGF accountable to someone external to and therefore there is some sort of a, a moment and point where IGF, in addition to, of course, provide the annual report, making sure that all the dynamic coalition provide their own report, and uh, having the, uh, the policy best practices the, the, and many other entities and bodies. But ultimately, the outcome of the IGF, is it reviewed, assessed, judged by someone else that is outside of us, or are we self-referential? And if so, I mean, it's not a bad thing, what are the criteria to self-assess ourselves? So I think that that would be some question that maybe will help addressing this issue about comparing and contrasting and identifying indeed there are gaps and how those gaps can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. I think in terms of accountability or the IGF does not operate in a vacuum. And it goes, it's ultimately the General Assembly of the United Nations that re renewed the mandate, first time for five years and last time in 2015 for 10 years, and it will review the mandate in 2025, and that's the ultimate assessment for the IGF. But in the meantime, I think also the IGF has made a continuous also self-assessment. It uh, has done that right from the beginning at the end of each annual meeting. There is an open microphone where people can make comments. And, and right from the beginning, there are many, many good ideas. But usually, then, implementation depends also on the means at disposal. And that this means also financial means. And that means staff. And yes, it would be nice to do this. But you do need means to, in order to do it. And the funding question came also up uh, this morning. There was a lady right at the back. Could you also introduce yourself? I don't know. I live mine of the One Goal Initiative for Governance about um, internet versus digital. Um, maybe you would like to, uh, anybody here would like to give me some, um, um, I guess, um, uh, feedback on uh, the following point, uh, angle uh, to approach this. So if it's internet or if it's digital, is there anything that is digital that never connects to the internet? And then there is, <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, that would be ex excluded then. Um, or which internet do we mean if there is an actual fragmentation, if and when there's an actual fragmentation? Uh, um, be it, you know, physical separation or, or a process that uh, separates the communications. Uh, in that case, uh, where do we, um, where are our actions taking place in which fragment? Uh, so from that angle, which comments would I be able to hear? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the discussion on that has also continued in the chat, and I think uh, Tracy referred to the Diplo Foundation, how they define it. And 
it's internet governance and digital policy, and also uh, the Swiss government has similar. But uh, I think the point you made is that anything digital that isn't connected to the internet was also the point I tried to make. So there's, in my view, really not that much of a difference between the three terms. We come now to the end of the first uh, 30 minutes discussion, but I see Bruna, I would like to add, please. Thanks, Marcus, and um, thanks, everybody, for the discussions. Just two things. I just don't want the idea to go any further about um, the main session organization process not being extremely open, because normally what we do is once we decide on the topics, on whether they're following the sub-themes or anything else, obviously it's, it's in between the tasks, kind of like basket of um, task, bigger basket of tasks um, to organize them, but we're also open to community input as we have been previously. And um, I mean, as Chris was saying, to have something more structured in the sense of, of how intersessional work is actually being brought into the, 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 our work, it's something that's super valuable. But just to highlight um, some of last year's, um, comparing to this year, um, actually reflections and we did saw that last year we got some sort of a duplication in terms of the fragmentation discussions or even um, the accessibility ones. And there is already um, an approach for the main sessions that was suggested by Secretariat that we might follow but, or we are open to discussing. But in any case, like just to flag that um, whenever we have a more um, structured suggestion or like ideas for the main sessions, it's really valuable for us to have something to follow upon. And just in terms of the assessments, um, a few years ago, the BPF gender, while um, it was still existing, we did run a good assessment on participation levels and how the gender um, balance was actually being used at the IGF level. So we did went through um, attendees, speakers in main sessions and things like that. And in the end of the day, it was really relevant to see how much more we needed to walk towards having like proper gender representation at the IGF level or in any other form. So. I would really like to maybe kind of reinforce this idea, whoever they see or maybe another intersessional work that's running this might be interesting to do some sort of the same level of assessment, especially with like people with disabilities or like any other um, kind of communities that do face some roadblocks in having access to the IGF or broader internet governance processes. So just that, thanks a lot. Thank you, all valid comments. Allow me just briefly, I mean, it, you know, to have a more structured approach that is in many ways our objectives, but you could also have kind of an incremental approach and just to think if you have a main session on inclusion, yes, uh, you could expect the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility would like to join, but you could also outreach at the outset and, hey, here we have experts who have been dealing with this for years. We need to have them part of the organization. So it goes both ways and uh, I think there's a lot of room for incremental improvement and a brief comment on Wout's point that we and that goes also back to what was mentioned this morning about a little bit of a rebranding that we maybe need to rebrand the intersessional sessions on the BPF or DC whatever it puts people off uh, with too many acronyms but the, the heading of the session should be interesting to attract people and it should be irrelevant in the end who is organizing the session but the session should be interesting but with that i would like to move to the second part of our presentations and we start with uh, internet fragmentation and i think we have two presenters uh, Wim, who had already spoken and also olivier capin de leblanc uh, who is going first, Wim or Olivier? I will go first, and we're actually with three because Bruno will take over as well. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we going to do three things in this uh, presentation. We approached um, the topic internet fragmentation, avoiding internet fragmentation first from what has happened at uh, last year's IGF. Then we will dive uh, a bit deeper in the work of the policy network this year, and then also give uh, an example of which, uh, like I already mentioned, a DC who is also discussing on uh, uh, this work. And this gives 
I think only a few angles of how uh, this is being discussed at IGF, and I'm sure in numerous uh, NRIs there are also similar discussions. So the next uh, slide, please. So we and Celine can confirm. We didn't quickly add this uh, slide on the messages because a lot of people uh, suggested that we should use the messages more uh, during this morning session. Uh, we already did this before. So be looking at last year's IGF and what came out in terms of messages. Uh, I selected the three uh, main uh, messages. There are uh, more messages on the topic of uh, Fragmentation, but the three uh, on top are, I think, very relevant for uh, for also this uh, discussion. The first message was that the GDC provides an opportunity to reassert to reassert the value of an open, interconnected internet for the realization of the UN Charter, achievement of the SDGs, and uh, exercise human rights. A second message that came out of last year's IGF was that uh, the discussions on internet fragmentation are multi-layered with different stakeholders giving a variety of meanings and interpretations to the term internet fragmentation and what it is and some also very strong on what it is not. Some are most concerned with the technical and uh, infrastructural aspects of the internet while others focus on public policy issues including access rights, impacts, and user experience. And this message is linked to the importance of uh, having an open and having an open discussion and open mind when discussing fragmentation with a respect and understanding for the different perceptions and experiences of fragmentation uh, to be able to, to discuss and sit around the table. And this is also, um, one of the key points I think that uh, were picked up from the messages uh, by the uh, by the high level panel in the, the summary. And then the last message I wanted to refer to is that a wide range of political, economic and technical factors can potentially drive fragmentation. However, uh, diversity and decentralization, for example, should not be mistaken for fragmentation. This brings me back to the idea that what some uh, there is a, a lot of discussion around the topic. What some see very strongly as fragmentation, others see uh, not as fragmentation. Like I mentioned, in the next slide, please. Uh, within this this context of this uh, many views and visions and ideas on what fragmentation is or not, uh, and its different aspects, there are different uh, IGF intersessional activities and NRIs and youth in initiatives uh, discussing and giving their views. Uh, I will hand over now to um, Bruna, who is uh, sitting in Geneva in the room, as she will um, give an overview of how the uh, policy network internet fragmentation last year and this year tried to, uh, to come up or try to um, follow up with this and, and, and try to stimulate and be a place for uh, the discussion around fragmentation. Bruna, please, if you can take the floor. Thanks, Wim. And um, once again, apologies for taking the floor. But just to, to run over the PN, um, it's on its sec sec actually the second year of work, right? We, um, we as the current work um, says, we normally get Policy networks for a two year um, mandates. Um, we're on the second year of the fragmentation one. And <clears throat> the initial goal was to kind of like bring in or further the discussion to on fragmentation and raise awareness on policy, legal, and technical, or any other aspects um, surrounding these debates and or anything that actually poses a risk to the internet um, as it is nowadays. But in 2022, and based on community discussions, we had a lot of. Um, really in-depth and, and relevant contributions to the debate and we decided on not actually going forward um, towards on like finding a definition but instead like trying to discuss approaches or even baskets and this brought us to the framework um, for discussing internet fragmentation and the goal for that is to have it as a general guiding or tool 
for continuing the dialogue um, and also allow for a more holistic and inclusive debate um, while um, creating this space for focused discussion on concrete solutions. On the next slide, um, you guys will see some of the, um, the baskets. Um, can, can we go to the... Uh, but just like just for everybody to know, we are currently dividing the work on three baskets. So fragmentation of the user experience, um, fragmentation of internet governance and coordination, and fragmentation of the technical layer. And over the course of this year so far, we hosted um, three webinars um, with the 2023 approach, which is unpacking, prioritizing, and addressing fragmentation. So we grabbed a lot of the discussions from the past years and the contributions from the community. And the idea is to understand um, what is fragmentation, what is not, and in the prioritization basket, um, what kind of manifestations should be avoided or addressed, and um, last but not least, what practices, guidelines, or principles could help us to address or prevent fragmentation. This still is an ongoing job, but um, once we concluded um, the, the workshops or the webinars, we did see that there is a lot of, like, underlying issues or questions that communicate to one more than one of the baskets and I do think we we have gathered a lot of examples and so the idea is to feed them into um, the session for the PN um, PNIF this year and see how can we further develop um, the ideas or discussions on that so any volunteers and input is very much welcome and we are working on the basis of three working groups um, to, to kind of like address each of these um, three aspects, unpacking, prioritizing, and addressing. So I think that's it from the, from, from the PNIF, but I, I believe um, Olivier um, has, to, has something to say about the disease as well. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please, Olivier. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus, and thanks, Bruna. Actually, uh, the next slide is still not me, so maybe back to Wim <laughs> as, a, as a linkage. Uh, okay. No, sorry. The previous previous slide was actually what Bruno explained. That explained that the he explained the it coming on the next slide, yeah. no in way the well. months is uh, working in those three dimensions, and that volunteers and other groups working on the topics are more than welcome to join. So the floor is yours now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wim. Olivier Clapanablon speaking, and I'm, I'm with the uh, Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values, and it's of course uh, um, some of the work that is going on. In this very topic of, uh, of fragmentation, um, the uh, coalition has been uh, running for quite some time and uh, has been looking at the uh, uh, technical standards by which uh, the internet is what the internet is, which effectively means uh, uh, some network that is able to sustain uh, the innovation that we have, uh, that we've seen over uh, all, all those years and the openness that we've seen over all those years. So uh, the list that you have on your screen, it's uh, some of those values that we've studied and uh, that we've uh, evaluated over the years, uh, some of which have actually been eroded over time. Uh, by global, we mean that the internet is a global medium open to all, uh, regardless of geography or, or nationality. Uh, it's interoperable, uh, which is the ability, of course, of a computer system to run application programs from different vendors, to interact with other computers across uh, local and wider area networks, completely regardless of uh, physical infrastructure and operating systems. And uh, this interoperability is also feasible through the hardware and the software components that conform to open standards, such as the ones um, that are used uh, for the internet and, and of course developed by the uh, IETF. It's an open network as a network of networks. Um, any standard compliant device is able to connect to it. Um, and uh, that means any type of data should be transmissible uh, through those networks um, and uh, the internet's core architecture itself is, is as i just mentioned based on on uh, open standards so this there's, there's a, a complete openness about this it's completely decentralized which means that it's free of central control um, of course the dns is one central control the domain name system but that's because you need a single uh, a, a single addressing scheme for it to work correctly, but uh, the rest of it is uh, pretty much very much distributed and decentralized. It's end-to-end -end, uh, with application-specific features residing in communicating uh, end nodes and, uh, uh, the, the, well, <laughs> 
originally, of course, uh, and now maybe a, a bit less so. It's user-centric. Um, the users really have full control or should have full control over the type of information and application and service that they're, uh, that they're running. And of course, it's robust and uh, reliable. Now, when you look at these uh, uh, values and you think of fragmentation, uh, then of course uh, the uh, if you break the global value, uh, and then then you're ending up of course with a uh, with a, a completely fragmented internet. If the internet uh, stops becoming interoperable and you start having uh, specific uh, services or uh, protocols or or, or uh, um, architectures that will actually break this interoperability, uh, whether commercial or governmental uh, linked. Uh, then you end up with fragmentation, uh, and it's the same thing also with open uh, the openness of, of of the internet. So these are three really obvious ones that would break uh, that would fragment the internet. There are of course others to various levels and various degrees, but that's a kind of example of the work that we do purely on the technical side of things, not looking at the other what one what a technologist would call the other layers. Um, if you look at the, the overall layers of technology, the technological layer, and then above that being the applications that are running and the uh, the information that that is uh, carried through it. I hope I haven't confused you too much, but we are continuing the work on this. And I know that other DCs are also uh, working on other aspects of this that also um, touch on fragmentation. So back to you, Im. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have come to the end of your joint collective presentation. Very good. And uh, you respected also your time limits. Meanwhile, the discussion on digital versus internet governance has going on in the chat, and maybe we have to revisit it. Maybe I have also reading some of the comments. I humbly uh, agree that maybe I was oversimplistic when I said it's exactly the same. I think Sivas made a very good point. If you have a land register in the digital form, it's not necessarily on the Internet, so there can be elements that are digital governance and not Internet governance. And there is also some, I would say, almost conversions that we should combine the two uh, on digital and Internet governance, digital policy, Internet governance, such as the uh, Diplo approach or the Swiss approach. And Tracy has been very active in the chat, maybe you would like to come back also and talk afterwards. But with that, without further ado, we go on to the next presentation of the Working Group on Data Governance and Trust. And Muriel is going to present. Please, Muriel, you have the floor. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Muriel Lapini, and I'm from the Benin IETF. Um, as is, as it is my first um, exercise in this type of meeting. Um, I would like to um, thank all the members of this working group who um, helped me and who will always help me um, in the chat and uh, for the comment answers. So next slide, please. So um, our working group work on data governance and trust. And we start our presentation, uh, we, uh, our pre-presentation with a definition. So data governance is a set of policies, processes, rules, and standards that define how data is collected, stored, used, and shared within an organization. Data governance aims to align data strategy with business goals, ensure data quality and integrity, protect data privacy and security, and enable data-driven decision-making. Data governance is not a, a one-time project, but a continuous practice that requires collaboration, communication, and coordination across different functions and levels. By realizing data governance trust in automated systems, digital tools, and the internet is built, users want technologies running efficiently, safe, secure, and in a way to serve and support so that we reach a better world. That is the internet we want. With the advance of the internet and the emergence of new technologies based on increasingly data intensive tools, it's becoming important for constructive discussion to be had by all internet governance stakeholders 
on these issues. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this presentation will attempt with your um, question, comment, uh, to provide a good overview of what work is going on and has been done within the different IGF communities. Identify the main challenges on data governance and trust in the age of emerging technologies. Compare different experiences and existing strategies or underline the lack of any. Identify challenges raised by a diversity of laws and regulation around the world, but also by time span between implementation and dissemination of regulation and technological advances. And last but not least, promote the necessity of media literacy to decrease the lack of knowledge about data protection issues by end users. Next slide, please. Therefore, um, the work of several dynamic coalition create a, a, a fundament on which also in the in future the IDF community will reach for solution. So um, we have here the example of the DC on blockchain technologies, blockchain assurance and standardization, data and artificial intelligence governance, dynamic coalition on data and trust, um, DC on DNS issues, as the Internet Standard Security and Safety Coalition Working Group, um, and the work of one of um, uh, the member of this uh, working group, um, Mr. Amali. So uh, that's all for me for this quick presentation, and um, we will continue the discussion in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for keeping to the time. And now we have one last presentation. That's working group uh, eight on human rights and freedoms. And uh, Jutta Kroll will be presenting. Jutta, please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you for giving me the floor. Can we have the slides, please? First of all, let me uh, say thank you to the team who have produced these wonderful visuals. I do think they all <laughs> fit very well to the issues that we are dealing with. Um, it was said before, uh, and it's it also correct for human rights and freedoms, that we have been discussing these since the World Summit of Information Society 2003. Uh, the principles of access and freedom, among others, have been presented as an unparalleled way to uphold human rights. And still we see that internet governance continues to be uh, an important and powerful instrument to realize human rights, but also we see that the internet is recognized as a, as a source for restricting human rights. Um, with this year's overarching theme, the internet we want, empowering all people, we see that human rights and freedoms shall be addressed appropriately in the program. Nonetheless, we, we need to continue to understand that human rights and freedoms in the digital environment, we should not take them for granted. Uh, thus, we are running the risk of overlooking conflicts. Human rights must not be played off against each other. Therefore, we need a balanced approach. Um, and with that approach, we can build on the intercessional work of a variety of dynamic coalitions and best practice forums. We have listed them here in the order as they are shown on the, on the IGF website. Uh, some of them have the right already in their title, and some of them uh, have been mentioned before in the presentations of the other speakers. And uh, I have tried to identify these interrelationships between uh, the other working groups. Uh, for example, you see on, on this slide as well the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. And of course, accessibility is a human right. Uh, when we have been uh, heard from, have heard from the um, working group on cybersecurity, where it was asked for a more secure and a safer internet by design that is also based on a human right principle to make the internet by design as 
safe, secure, and accessible as possible. Um, when, um, let me have a look at my, <laughs> of course, uh, the global digital governance and cooperation uh, asked for a secure digital future anchored in human rights. So again, we have a link between, between these areas. Uh, also, um, the dynamic coalition of core internet values, which has just been speaking, refer to the user-centric approach, and the user-centric approach can only be built on human rights. And last but not least, uh, we heard about data governance and trust, and privacy is one of the core human rights. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So what are the objectives of this presentation now in a more general level? A good overview of what work is going on and has been going on since WISIS 2003 and then uh, with, in all the Internet Governance Forums. Uh, and we have seen that from the many presentations and also uh, the work that was going on on human rights and freedoms. But also we would like to highlight the opposing positions and tensions because we need to find a holistic approach. We, we see that, uh, that there are tensions between human rights, but none of the human rights uh, should be prioritized over another human right. And that is uh, to emphasize the importance of finding a holistic approach. Next slide, please. Um, the specific objectives are to identify possibly new threats to human rights that may evolve from censorship, from shutdowns, or from unregulated developments in technology such as artificial intelligence could be. Then we need to explore new strategies to promote human rights in the digital environment and, was said before, assess what lessons have been learned and what conclusions can be drawn from failure and success stories. The overall, overall objective is to create synergies between human rights advocates and those who de develop the services. Um, and that would be in order to establish a human rights by design approach to internet governance. So we put human rights and freedoms first, but that should be built on the principles of privacy by design, safety by design, accessibility, by design, and there could be more by design principles as well. Uh, last slide, please. Ah, okay, those resources are not <laughs> uh, Maybe we put them, ah, there, are. They, there they are. So these are some of the, of the resources that have already been produced around human rights and freedoms, and I'm pretty sure there are more to be found on the IGF website. Thank you. Thank you, Jutta. And the last slide showed actually the considerable work that has been done by the DCs. I mean, the, the DCAT guidelines have been used by the IGF Secretariat for actually when preparing the annual event. So, uh, and, and the other ones are also equally uh, impressive. Now, with that, I think we open. Marcus. If you allow me a final Please. word that I forgot before, when you refer to the accessibility guidelines, I think accessibility is a very good example of this evolving nature, because before we had the internet, we had a completely understa different understanding of what accessibility is. It was about uh, stairways, entering a building or, or something like that. And with the internet and with the digital environment, we got a new uh, understanding of uh, accessibility. And that's why it's necessary to have those guidelines to adapt to the evolvement of the environment that encompasses us. And I think that is, it could act as an example, which is also adequate for other areas where we have an understanding of something and it changes with the internet, with digitization, and then we need to adapt to that and have new guidelines, new regulations maybe, and a new understanding. Thank you. Thank you. 
And as I said, uh, the discussion on digital versus internet has been going on in the chat. I have already admitted defeat. My maybe simplistic answer was wrong, and I learned a lot in the chat as well. But uh, I think Ariette defined it very nicely. The two spheres are not the same, but they are largely interlinked. I think that sums it up nicely. And there was also Jorge, who already has his hand up, commented on the chat, and I think uh, I very much agree with him, and he says, but digital sounds trendier. I think it's clearly the fashion now is you talk about digital policy and not about internet governance. But Jorge, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I'll spare you the historical um, um, essay about this, but it's true, and uh, I guess there are some some guilty people in this room or nearby that uh, in 2017, when we had the, the IGF here in Geneva, we tried to um, frame it uh, as digital. We, everywhere we put digital, and uh, also the, the motto of, uh, of the meeting was shape your digital future. Uh, we had uh, a high-level session on the digital global governance, and uh, there, there was a lot of talk about cooperation. And this was the first time uh, that the UN Secretary General, albeit by a video message, participated in uh, an IGF. So uh, we had some months later uh, the, the first discussions about the creation of a high-level panel on digital cooperation which was an idea that initially was brought to my minister at the time. And so uh, we went to Guterres because we thought this is uh, something that needed to be talked at the, the United Nations level. And when discussing the terms of, uh, of reference of that panel, uh, there was this uh, kind of merger between digital global governance and digital cooperation. So finally it was digital cooperation. And if somebody uh, uh, able enough was to make an historical search of Google uh, or any other search engine, of course, uh, probably they would uh, realize that uh, this concept uh, emerged in uh, uh, end of 2017, early 2018. And really, the, <clears throat> the intention was to cover the same issues as internet governance, but, but with a sort of an update behind it. And of course, with this more trendier topic, um, or more trendier term, and also with a term that was not so much contaminated by the past. Because just think, and those who have been long enough here to, to know what I'm uh, uh, referencing to, uh, think if we had uh, chosen uh, enhanced cooperation. So it would be uh, dead uh, from, from the beginning. So the, there was a need to, to find something that in 2018 was, uh, was uh, trendy enough, attractive enough also for the UN Secretary General. And of course, nobody was talking anymore about internet governance. Uh, everyone was talking about the digital future. So that's really the, the story, at least to my eyes. But of course, uh, this is like poetry. As, uh, as soon as you get uh, your poem out, uh, the interpretations can vary a lot. Thank you. Thank you for the historical overview, Jorge. Now, comments, questions? To, we have all heard all six presentations, and I think uh, they served the purpose of this session well. They illustrated how rich all this intercessional work is and how it touches on many areas. Who would like to comment? Or do you prefer a coffee break? Vote. Uh, thank you, Marcus. And preventing you to go to your coffee break too late. I will try to be brief. 
What I would like to do is thank Mark Ravel, who's online probably, but he came up with the idea for this session. And I think it turned out to be very good. I think that the Dynamic Coalitions, the Policy Networks, and the BPFs who wanted to participate in this session were able to get their message across tremendously well. And I hope that that leads to these kind of sessions in the future so that we can have more cooperation and more synergies within the IGF. There's one topic I would like to bring to the MAG from my own Dynamic Coalition, and that is that as I said this morning, we are going to produce some major policy comparison reports, some toolkits and guidelines in Kyoto. And the question is, what are we going to do with them? So what we would prefer is that the MAG, the Secretariat, that perhaps you and DESA together discuss how these sort of reports, it is not only my reports or my coalition's report, but also others who strive for that, to get them officially recognized as an IGF output and not just something which is vaguely on the outskirts of the IGF. So that we can actually use them when we go beyond the IGF and try to get the theory into practice. Because as, as Dino mentioned, the IGF will not do that, but the IGF can bring outputs, toolkits to other organizations if it organize, organizes itself that way. So the call for the MAG and the Secretariat and UNDESA, please start this discussion in the coming days, not to conclude it because you're working on something else, but to start it and perhaps see where that can lead. So, Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today because I think that was very valuable for all of us to be able to do and that you that took the time to listen to us. So thank you very much. And Marcus and Celine also, thank you for getting this all together because without you, that would not have happened also. Uh, thank you. I have four people who ask for the floor. I will give them the floor one after the other. Nigel, Utah, Bruna and Chris. And I will keep quiet in between. So, Nigel first. Nigel Hickson. Yes, good afternoon, Nigel Hickson, uh, UK uh, uh, DSEC or, or, or something. I'll be very brief indeed, because I, I, I mean, I didn't tune into every single word, but I, you know, this session was excellent. Uh, and the content was rich. And thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, others. Thank you, Marcus, for, for making sure that it had this focus. So following on from that, the issue is, and this is why I, I really, you know, thank Mark for placing this session on the agenda, is, is, is that for many people out in, in, in our wider community, they still don't really see what the IGF is, 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 is all about in terms of the value of the intersessional work. Uh, I mean, I, I you know, wrote a speech for the minister for our UK IGF tomorrow, and one of the points that I hope the minister will make is, is, is that the IGF is not a conference. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a conference. You know, I'm not trying to be stupid, but, you know, the more we focus on, on an event like Kyoto, uh, and I'm not, not trying to reduce the significance, it's very significant indeed, but we have to make sure that we, we focus, we keep this focus, not just on the UN IGF conference, on the forum every year, not just on the on the European and national and youth uh, national regional initiatives, which are so important and which sometimes people don't grasp either, but also on the value of this intersessional work. And we must really, you know, package those as the as the three components of this this whole IGF process. But I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you for giving me the floor. I just wanted to respond to uh, Wout Denatris. Uh, and it's, I really appreciate that we will discuss the question of uh, formal recognition of reports from dynamic coalitions further on within the MAC. Uh, still, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about that because I do think a formal recognition of anything that is produced within 30 dynamic collisions we have now, I think, 
would need a formal process, a formal evaluation process, uh, because I, I'm not longer a MAG member, but I could not give recognition to anything that I have not read before and seen before. So we would need criteria, we would need a proper evaluation process we, before we could give recognition to that, and that should be also discussed in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you. Bruno? Thank you, um, Marcus and Selim. No, just about, I was about to go on the same path as you, as about the formal recognition. I think we are already doing like as much as we can in terms of um, acknowledging the work and helping like actually put it forward and, and share it with the community because if we wanted for this like enhanced um, acknowledgement process, then it would mean that there should be some sort of like a, a strength and consensus around those things. And I don't think it's necessarily what we need or we could achieve right now. I don't know in which other ways could we support the DCs, and I think this might be one of the strategies, like having this kind of a closer conversation. But in terms of the support, I'm actually open to two other ideas. But I was, it was more of a request. Um, since we're going to start um, discussing main sessions and everything else, would it be possible, um, probably Celine, to kind of like summarize the suggestions that were handed um, by each of the working groups, just so we have it in mind when we start discussing both the topics and um, which of the sub-teams are going to take the slots. So, yeah, just a request. Thank you. And Chris? Okay. Yes. Well, there has been also in the chat, I think, uh, strong support for, to Utah's comments and also Henriette in the chat says, says agree strongly, Utah. Formalizing DCs and recognition of their work could be potentially counterproductive. Sharing it, on the other hand, when relevant, definitely will add value, and that's also very much along the lines of what Bruna said. And I would also like to recall the uh, basically one of the strengths of the Dynamic Coalition is their, their independence, their self-constituted, their bottom-up, their not under the supervision of the MAG, but at the same time, this freedom uh, has also its price. I mean, they cannot then say we are the same as the BPFs who clearly work under the supervision of the MAG or the PNs and where the secretariat holds the pen. I mean, the DCs produce their own work and that may vary greatly in terms of quality, but there is no formal process in place. And if you move towards a formal process, then I think that is Ariet's uh, point, could be in the end be counterproductive because it would bring them under the supervision of the MAG. And is that what you want? I mean, this is an issue to be discussed, but uh, I see there is also Mark who would like to react. Please, you have the floor. Yes, um, thank you, thank you, Marcus. I mean, I, I didn't want to come in on that particular question, um, but generally about um, the value of this uh, session, I think it's worked very well, and um, it's it's provided, I think, uh, a very valuable opportunity uh, for all the intersessional activities uh, to to highlight how they can contribute to meaningful IGF outcomes. And, and also it's helped, I think, to identify strong areas of linkage and cross-fertilization across the IGF uh, eco ecosystem. It's been, um, I think, uh, a revelation, I think, and especially, I think, for newcomers to the IGF, I think that it will have provided many valuable pointers to uh, how they can contribute throughout the year to the IGF uh, through engagement in, uh, in dynamic coalitions, uh, in, in the best practice for uh, the policy networks and of course the national and regional IGFs as well. So I, I hope um, this can become uh, a regular fixture in the IGF uh, calendar. Uh, there will be opportunities of course uh, for all uh, dynamic coalitions and uh, uh, best practice for and policy networks and uh, NRIs to to uh, 
showcase their work in the, in the program in uh, Kyoto. But subsequently, uh, you know, an intersessional forum like this next year, I think, would be extremely important to to retain um, for the benefits that I've that I've uh, outlined. And also, I, I wonder if um, the working groups that have um, reported today that were put together at fairly short notice um, and uh, have, have provided very coherent. Um, summaries and, and uh, pointers for the future. I, I wonder if those working groups can actually continue and maybe uh, the roster of working groups could be extended to include um, focus on emerging technologies and uh, uh, issues that are, that are other issues that are directly relevant to uh, the IGF scope and also to the to the UN agenda. Uh, can be, you know, they can be brought together in in, uh, in, in uh, similar working groups to add to the six who have um, presented so effectively and coherently uh, today. So there's, there's my my thoughts and, and, and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, I think, uh, well, I hope uh, that most of you in the room would agree that uh, the session has proved uh, very valuable. I said at the outset it was an experiment and obviously we didn't have that much time to add our contribution but uh, we could definitely build on that also in the future and uh, in the ICANN world they call it the cross-community working group if you put together people outside the silos and they work together and I think uh, this approach having the intersessional community as cross communities working together on one issue could be one potential way of dealing also with new and emerging issues. If, you know, the man could say, hey, why don't we form a working group? And I mean, this one was very much opting in. We chose the themes that were given by the MAG. We thought that would be a very logical starter. And we ask, and thanks to Celine, she was herding the cats. Uh, we ask then the interested members of the various uh, components of the intercession community to opt in and to join the group. But I think uh, this kind of approach uh, could definitely be uh, carried on in the future for future exercises. And that could also be uh, driven or suggested by the MAG, hey, why don't we form uh, such a working group on this or on that issue or the mag could say why don't we try and develop a main session with this approach this is just thinking aloud but uh, i think uh, based on this experience uh, i can say that we have shown uh, also especially for new mag members i think this may be helpful to see what's actually happening in this very confusing environment with so many different components and acronyms. Uh, are there more comments? Yes, Walt, please. Just one final comment, Marcus, that on re responding to Bruna and what Chris wanted to say also, I think, that yes, if a BPF gets recognition, it means that, a, oh, sorry, a dynamic coalition, what, does not want recognition will not go through that process and yes if you want to go through that process there should be a process towards recognition because otherwise it will never be formal and is3c is willing to go through that process so ask but we ask to start the discussion on it if it's even a possibility i also got a message saying many mag members still don't understand what this session is for and I think that perhaps we should explain it once more, Marcus, as I understand there's still a lot of questions about this session in the room. But perhaps there isn't, but then uh, that could be clarified now. Okay, thank you for that. And I take it also from your comment that you envisage in a way of what the European Union calls a geometry variable, that you would have some DCs who are completely outside the supervision of the MAG, whereas some others would be willing 
to go through a process of scrutiny, assessment, and appro approval, which could also mean a rejection. Mark might say, no, we don't think you're good enough, but that's uh, what I understand is your potential point. But Chris, you would like to come in on that immediately, please. Thanks, Marcus, and thanks, Val. Um, it's Chris Buckridge here, MAG member. I, I mean, I think the bigger question I have regarding that, when you talk about assessment, when you talk about scrutiny, that's resource-intensive work. Who's doing that? I, I, so I, we know that the Secretariat is under-resourced. We know that not all MAG members are, are sort of fully engaged all the time. There needs to be, like, if, if you're going to say the MAG or whoever, I mean, I, I don't think actually the MAG could endorse on behalf of the UN. That would be a whole other process to get UN endorsement. But what you're suggesting there is not a lightweight process for an institutional recognition and endorsement of an output. And I think you need to, or who are in this discussion, we need to be from the very outset very realistic of where are we seeing those resources come from? Who is going to be doing that assessment of work that has been produced? And I honestly, like at, at this point, there are so many discussions about, you know, that, that sort of hinge on this matter of there are very limited resources for the IGF. This, I'm not sure, is, is sort of at the top of the pile in terms of what we would do if we had the resources that we feel that the IGF deserves and could use. Yeah, to, to respond, Chris. But we... But, okay, yeah, but to respond directly, Marcus, if No, possible. no, no, please. Uh, they, Adam no? had the hand up as okay. well. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. And out, we've had this discussion and spoken about some other outputs from dynamic coalitions. I think it's important to go back to the whole notion of a dynamic coalition. You are a self-forming group, right? You do it almost as a birds of a feather. You're, that's the whole point of it. We have a structure of entities and organizational structures within the IGF, and we have dynamic coalitions which form. We have best practice forums, which are looked in some way by the, by the MAG. We have policy networks. We have structures that come in part from the IGF uh, Secretariat and the MAG. Um, so I think you're asking too much. And as we've said, you have very good outputs. We've had this discussion. We've also had discussions about, for example, a dynamic coalition on network neutrality who produced some outstanding work, which has been broadly recognized. But the reason it was recognized was because it was outstanding work. You have no particular standing here. And that's the whole point of your coalition, is that you exist because of that. You have the freedom to do the work that you want. And if you want the fat freedom, that's great. Do the good work. You've done the good work. There is no way for us to endorse it. We can't go through a process as we're doing now, going through 400 workshops to review every piece of work that comes out of a dynamic coalition. Not only do we not have the expertise, we don't have the time, etc. cetera. Um, so I think you should stand alone, be proud of the work you've done, which we recognize as being extremely good. We will talk about it, you publish it, you promote it, and you'll have us as a platform to promote you, but it will be because we're individual members who recognize the work that you're doing. But I think you're misunderstanding and trying to, a lot of this discussion has been about trying to elevate things all over the IGF and complicate things. You know, we've got dynamic coalitions. We have these working groups, and I don't know where the working groups come from, and I'm a MAG member. They're doing interesting work, but we want to be careful about what structures we're creating here in a rather ad hoc way, because it's, it, 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 it just breaks the process. And at a time when we're trying to make this process really work and emphasize its good work, we want to be a little bit careful about where things are popping up from and people claiming that they're speaking for whoever they're speaking for. Anyway, I'll stop there, but I think your work is extremely good. You have my promise that I will push it and promote it wherever I can, um, but I think you're asking too much to, uh, and so are the others, about you know, wanting, wanting some you know, IGF endorsement. We just can't do it, and it's not how the IGF is and should be structured, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just allow me one brief comment, Adam. Uh, the working groups, I mean, this was just an implementation thing uh, 
the MAG had, when we made the proposal to have this intercessional uh, session, uh, that we needed to implement it, and uh, then we thought it would be best to form these ad hoc working groups to deal with these issues. But again, the main aim of this session was to provide food for thought as an input into the themes, the eight themes identified by the MAG, and some of these will then also be the main sessions at the Kyoto IGF. But that's essentially all, and incl including to uh, bring to the attention of the MAG uh, the work done by the various components, uh, DCs, BPFs, PNs, and NRIs. The NRIs were maybe not that involved in this intercessional uh, session, but nevertheless, I think we recognize uh, their value. Uh, Wout, you also wanted to react, please. Yes, and thank you, Adam. I totally appreciate what you say, except that I've come into the discussion from a different angle, and that angle is IGF output. And as we have a good discussion on making this the IGF play second fiddle to a digital uh, cooperation uh, forum, then we have to position the IGF in a way that it becomes as strong as possible. And one of that options is the tangible output that is being produced. And yes, I totally appreciate how hard work we're all doing. But if I look at my own dynamic coalition, we've got a gover governance structure. That means that we try to copy what the best practice for uh, and a policy network is doing as much as possible by trying to organize public sessions where input can be delivered just like the BPS and the PNs do. The only difference in the end is that they have a paid consultant from the UN and I am paid as a coordinator by others. And I don't know, I can't speak for the other dynamic coalitions because I don't know how they organize themselves, but if we adhere to a process that is being mandated basically like already exists then it's about the end product getting some sort of a stamp and yes somebody will have to look at it but not evaluate the whole process if we organize ourselves according to what is already an IGF process and perhaps that, that can assist but I don't know if the MAG should decide on it, or that there is UN DESA that needs to decide on it, because it's in the end about the UN logo, that gives it another quality. If I go to the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise saying, I've got this proposal, shall we work on it, then I have the UN logo and not something that nobody knows what it is. So that is why I'm making this distinction and this question to get some sort of a formal recognition. And that can be achieved without too much work, in my opinion, if we organize according to a framework. That is the way the BPS and the policy networks are. And then, yes, Wim or other colleagues, Maya, Maike, they are responsible for the final product. Well, in our case, Mark and I am, am responsible for the final product because nothing goes out without our uh, blessing, basically. But I understand what Adam is saying, but I would like to give this other view that perhaps it is possible to do without extra enormous burdens on individuals. So I'll stop there, Marcus. Well, one correction. The UN doesn't have a logo. It's an emblem. I stand... Now, I would also like to point out that we did, when was it two or three years ago, we did a report on the BPFs, and uh, I was then asked, I think it was Lynn who was the chair to chair the process, and uh, Wim was holding the pen, and I think also one of our findings was that the various structures should not necessarily be cast in stone, but the BPF may continue once it has run out of steam as a DC or the other way around, that it may also, a DC might graduate into a BPF, but that's yet another story. 
But the basic distinction is, as we know, the PNs and the BPFs are chosen by the MAG, are under the authority of the MAG, and are driven by the Secretariat with Secretariat scrutiny over their output, and that's why they're entitled uh, to the recognition. But that's obviously open for discussion how to carry on. And my take, I think we're reaching the end, uh, is also uh, coming from the interest, the issue of whether the IGF is Internet Governance Forum or Digital Policy, that may be in terms of rebranding, and that was also an issue that came up in this morning's discussion, should be seriously considered whether the IGF may not wish a suggestion of its uh, branding and something to be put forward to the powers that be when it comes to renewal of the IGF in 25. With that, I think uh, we can conclude. Selin, have I forgotten anything? Do you have any last comments? There were serious comments, I think, also addressed to you. And let me also thank you for your hard work in preparing this session. Please, Selin. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, so maybe just to uh, also from the Secretariat to thank all the uh, working groups that have uh, been working very hard, uh, especially in the past uh, few days. We know that we haven't given you a lot of time, and still you came up with uh, very good presentations. Um, and just also to respond to uh, Bruna's comment, so we've asked the working groups to um, provide us a short summary paragraph, and we're going to um, make this document available as well as the presentations with the additional uh, links in the annexes. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and active collaboration in this session. Thank you. The session is closed. Okay, we'll have five minutes, ending at five past five. Please, can you be back in this room? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can we please take our seats? We do have people online who are waiting. Uh, Jorge, if we can sit down. Tamir, if you can wrap it up. Adam? <laughs> So we're coming down to the wire for today, and hopefully you've felt that the uh, afternoon so far has been very productive. There are seven more small presentations to go through uh, about internet intergovernance inter issues with the internet and various agencies. So um, start going right to it. Tim Engelhart from the Human, Human Rights Officer from the Geneva uh, UN. Take it away. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, indeed, um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you remotely. Um, the implications of digital technologies for the enjoyment of all human rights are obvious every day. For many years, our office has been working on a broad range of topics concerning digital technologies and their governance, advising states, businesses, UN partners, and other stakeholders. Let me give you a few concrete examples of our recent work that uh, I hope will trigger some interest of our further follow-up. Uh, just last week, we presented a new report to the Human Rights Council that analyzes the relationship between technical standard setting processes and human rights. The report discusses the relevance of technical standards for the enjoyment of human rights and examines challenges to integrating human rights considerations and technical standard setting processes. It provides recommendations for active, effective integration of human rights considerations and technical standard setting processes. And we are continuing our work on technical standards and initiating a project on technical standard setting to contribute to the implementation of our recommendations. In September 2022, we released a report to the Human Rights Council on the right to privacy in the digital age. The report focuses on three particular trends, the widespread abuse of commercial spyware by state authorities, the central role of encryption in enabling human rights, and human rights requirements for measures of surveillance of public spaces online and offline. We also take actively part in the negotiation process of a new convention on cybercrime, assisting states in identifying and incorporating human rights-based approaches into provisions on criminalization, procedural and law enforcement measures, international cooperation, and capacity building. We also work actively on the field of business and human rights in our BTEC project, which is based on multi-stakeholder participation. We develop in-depth guidance on the application of the guiding principles on business and human rights to digital technology sectors. In the last few months, we have started a project fo focusing on African technology industries. The governance of artificial intelligence is of central importance to our, our work. Our Human Rights Council report on AI from September 21 provides clear guidance on measures that need to be taken to ensure that AI is developed and deployed in human rights conforming ways. This year, our BTEC team has started a new project on the roles and responsibilities of companies providing and using generative AI systems. We invite you all to get in touch if you have any questions, would like to contribute to our work, or join forces in other ways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next in, in order, we have Dino Cataldo Della Taccio, Chief Information Officer from Geneva. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you to the Secretariat. So I just wanted to uh, share uh, with all the colleagues three points vis-a-vis -vis, um, the work done within the UN system. And also, uh, if you will, the 
the driver of my presence in the in the IGF and specifically in the MAG. So the three areas that uh, I would like to address are sharing, building trust, and communicating. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, echoing what was said this morning vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the need to avoid duplication and the need to demonstrate how and whether the IGF at the MAG makes a difference. Um, at the UN, we have a concrete example of an initiative that was developed and implemented by the UN Pension Fund for the digital identity to create a digital identity of its 84,000 retirees and beneficiaries that are located in 192 countries around the world. This solution was implemented in 2000. One, it went live, it's in production. And after that, it, it really attracted a lot of attention within the international community, beyond actually the UN system. And what happened is that I started to be approached by other entity that started asking whether we could sell the solution itself. And of course, as you can appreciate, the UN is not in the business of selling anything, but the idea was actually that it was evident to me that there was a big opportunity here to share and to capitalize on what was done within the pension fund for the benefit of the UN system at large, as well as other international organizations and all the stakeholders that are represented in this body. So this was really one of the first drivers that led me to participate in the, in the IGF to share this initiative, this solution for the benefit of everybody and also to work together on how to create assurance. And that goes to the second point, building trust. Being the solution based on biometric technology and the blockchain, as you can appreciate, there was a lot of skepticism and concern. And there are still, of course, concern vis-a-vis -vis security, vis-a-vis -vis the use of a personal identifiable information, and all the aspects related to data privacy. Hence, I was very pleased that uh, we were able to create and establish a new dynamic coalition, specifically on blockchain assurance and standardization, which goes beyond the simple blockchain technology, but it's focused on many building blocks to create that level of assurance. And there is a progress. The solution already gave input to a much wider and bigger initiative within the UN system for the creation of a UN digital ID for all the UN staff member across the system. And we are currently documenting the use cases to start piloting the solution with five UN entities, UNDP, UNICEF, World Food Program, the UN Secretariat with the support of UNICC, the United Nations International Computing Center. And finally, I just and I'm not going to repeat what I mentioned before, but I think from the point of view of communicating, I really want to uh, show appreciation for the amount of information data that is available in the UN IGF website. I think there is a wealth of data, a wealth of information that is very valuable, and as mentioned before, could benefit from an effort of summarization Compare and contrasting, and really identifying and focusing on the tangible impact and outcome that have been mentioned many times during the various conversation that uh, have taken place. So again, uh, I look forward to work with all the colleagues, and uh, we at the UN Pension Fund and the UN at Large, we are happy to share and to engage in anybody who's interested specifically in creating on issue related. To digital identity. Thank you. And thank you. And next we have Valerie Dattencourt from APC. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Valeria Betancourt. I am a former IGF BAC member and today I have the privilege to share updates on behalf of the Association for Progressive Communications in relation to our internet governance work so far in 2023. And thank you for the opportunity to present this brief uh, update. 
um, as an organization that works at the intersection of human rights and digital technologies for human and ecosystems well-being, we have continued with our engagement in different fora, including the open-ended working group on cybersecurity to develop rights and gender responsive policy responses to cybersecurity challenges. Also, our engagement with the International Telecommunications Union around increasing the recognition of the value and role of local solutions and community networks for digital inclusion and increasing the capacity of regulators at national levels on regulatory re approaches for complementary connectivity solutions. Uh, similarly, uh, our work in alliance with other stakeholders in the context of the global partnership for action on gender-based online harassment and abuse the Commission on the Status of Women and the Human Rights Council as part of our efforts to design responses to online gender-based violence, gendered disinformation and disinformation against environmental defenders. Uh, we have also been actively participating in and contributing to the Global Digital Compact in the understanding that it could play a key role in ensuring that the lessons learned from years of a multi-stakeholder cooperation feed into future processes of internet policy, internet governance, and global digital cooperation, and in setting parameters for safeguarding multi-stakeholderism, transparency, inclusivity, dialogue, and accountability. We believe that the Global Digital Compact is an opportunity to strengthen and expand the mandate of the IGF to contribute to reinterpret the WISIS vision, to respond to the fact that internet governance and digital cooperation are interlinked and that we need both to respond to the constantly changing digital society, society that we live in today. So the IGF is well suited to facilitate cooperation across the board. We have continued to collaborate with civil society groups and other stakeholders in our engagement with the regional IGFs in Africa, Latin America and Asia, and with the national IGFs in Kenya and Ghana, and link to the research and policy advocacy work of our programs in the APC to overcome digital inclusion and to achieve gender and environmental justice. We have prepare session proposals for the IGF this year, tackling issues that are of the interest of the IGF community, such as technology facilitated gender-based violence and the intersections with sexuality, nationalism and occupation. Also in the area of lock tech solutions towards sustainable universal connectivity and different approaches to look at the nature of the internet and its governance. Regarding IGF intersessional work, we are engaging with the policy network of meaningful access, participating in its meetings, and the survey to identify priorities, as well, as well, as well as preparing a submission in response to the call by the DC3, DC3 for its, its input this year. We are also participating in the initial meetings of the policy network on artificial intelligence. Um, also, the African School of Internet Governance which APC hosts is planned to be held before the African IGF this year. Lastly, I would uh, reinstate that in APC's view, uh, the IGF remains at the heart of the internet and global digital cooperation ecosystems. There is no, in our view, a key equivalent space for enabling public participation, shared learning, monitoring of progress in achieving inclusive human rights-based people-centered internet and digital governance, and discussing the positive and negative impacts of the internet and internet policy in a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder setting. So no effort is too great to strengthen the IGF, and we will continue our efforts in that direction. Uh, and if you are interested to know more about uh, these pieces of work that I have shared, I could be happy to provide more details. So please feel free to contact me at any time. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, next we have Tameo Suto, Global Digital Policy Lead from uh, Geneva UNDP. What he said is true. She's from International Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, 
indeed I am from the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> happy to uh, work with the UNDP anytime. <laughs> Uh, many thanks for the opportunity to, to share some brief updates uh, on behalf of ICC. For those of you who might not know us, ICC is the institutional representative of over 45 million businesses, uh, reaching more than 170 countries, with a mission to make business work for everyone, every day, everywhere. We are the primary voice of the real economy in a range of intergovernmental organizations championing the needs of local businesses in global decision making. In the context of internal governance, you might be more familiar with ICC's BASIS initiative, which is the acronym for our business action to support the Information Society project. After WISIS in 2006, where ICC represented industry, BASIS was launched at the request of companies that realized the importance of global business coordination of, on internet governance and ICT and digital policy issues. BASIS draws upon consensus-built policy positions and practice recommendations that are developed by the ICC's Global Digital Economy Commission that gathers experts from across sectors and regions of ICC's far-reaching global network. On behalf of users, providers, and operators of um, ICTs and digital technologies, the Commission and BASIS address a prioritized set of digital policy issues that not only impact daily business activities, but also make headway towards the goals of sustainable growth and development. The responsible development, deployment, and use of digital technologies depend on broader enabling policy frameworks that are founded on trust, respect for human rights, global trade, open markets, the rule of law, sustained public and private sector investments, and technology neutrality. Creating an enabling environment in close cooperation with all stakeholders is essential for all to benefit from the economic and social dividends of the digital age and to mitigate its, its challenges. We work closely with policymakers to contribute to the creation of such legal policy and regulatory frameworks. Today, I would just like to highlight a few updates from our very recent work. As we have discussed the Global Digital Compact earlier today, I wanted to start by sharing ICC's inputs to this process. In addition to providing substantive input and sharing policy recommendations on what the GDC could include, and that, was, that we submitted last year, earlier this year we sealed this initial contribution with a second substantive submission that presents the finding of the Global ICC Business Survey featuring input from businesses of all sizes in over 40 countries and close to 20 sectors of industry. The report of the survey is online on the GDC website and I invite you all to consult it. Happy to provide the link if you don't find it. I would also like to flag for your awareness a sneak peek, really, uh, a campaign that we will be launching in a couple of weeks. ICC strongly believes that effectively harnessing the unique opportunities of digitalization is a real catalyst towards the attainment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, ensuring an equitable and sustainable future for all. Business investment and digitalization has and will continue to have a transformative socioeconomic impact. With 2023 marking the midterm review of the SDGs, we all know that the global community is falling short of reaching the set objectives. Recent years in particular have shown how digitalization has become a prerequisite to inclusive and sustainable development for people, planet, and prosperity, and how it can play a leading role in bringing the 2030 agenda back on track. Against this backdrop, ICC will drive a year-long campaign, which you might have guessed, we, we entitled Digitalization for People, Planet and Prosperity, that draws on evidence and lessons learned by business, showcasing the leadership of the private sector in advancing the SDGs through digitalization. ICC has previously offered policy recommendations and showcased learnings and strategies of business and furthering um, sustainable development. We have brought these recommendations and papers to the IGF uh, in previous years. So now building on these existing positions, the campaign will leverage input from ICC's broad and diverse business network to highlight through real world examples, evidence and case studies, the importance of harnessing the power of digital technologies and innovative solutions towards the SDGs. And third and last, I'd like to share with you progress on our work with regards to data governance, as this is closely linked to our engagement with the IGF. In the past two years, we have focused on trusted governance of personal data, and we ran workshops at the IGF on the topic for two years now. And we have incorporated the feedback received in a paper we launched last year on trusted government access to personal data held by the private sector. 
This year, we are focusing with our members on drafting a policy primer on non-personal data that will be the base for ICC's work on data governance questions more specifically, and we are hoping to be ready to launch this paper at the IGF in Kyoto. And on that note, I'd like to conclude by sharing that um, just like in the past 17 years, ICC BASIS will be coordinating the participation of a global business delegation to the annual IGF meeting, and we are very much looking forward to meeting all of you there. Should you like to learn more about our projects or contribute your insights to or to collaborate with us in any way? And of course, in the meantime, please reach out to me online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Anush Rima from UNDP. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Um, thank you to the Secretariat and the MAG Chair for this opportunity. To keep it very brief, I just want to share three updates from UNDP uh, with relevance to the community and some of the priority themes for this year. Um, first, to do with AI, as we know, the pace of change and the capabilities of AI technology in this past year have been astounding. Um, UNDP is an active member of the UN Interagency Working Group on Artificial Intelligence, and this group has put together uh, put forward AI ethical standards and UNDP co-leads a readiness and impact assessment work stream together with ITU and UNESCO. Um, one concrete tool that was created by UNDP as a result of this work stream is the AI readiness assessment, uh, which is a tool designed as an assessment tool for governments that comprehensively maps out all AI activities that a government has undertaken while also providing an analysis of the entire society's readiness for AI. Uh, we are already engaged with about 15 countries on this AI readiness assessment, including Bolivia, Rwanda, and Colombia, hopefully, and hope to share some of the early insights uh, and results and get some feedback on ways to improve and expand this AI readiness assessment during an open forum session at IGF in October. Um, number two, there's another area of major work uh, that UNDP has been pursuing over the last year relating to co digital cooperation more broadly. Uh, and that is around advancing digital public infrastructure. Um, as many of you know, um, when implemented with a rights-based and an inclusive manner, DPI has enormous potential in helping communities uh, build resilience, drive inclusion, and accelerate SDG progress. Um, several governments, several member states are already leaders in developing DPI, using it to advance digital payments, enable data sharing, uh, widen health and justice provision and expand uh, e-commerce and employment. So UNDP is helping to support more countries learn from the experience of peer nations and expand uh, this uh, taking a rights-based governance approach to DPI and building capacity and local um, in, in robust ecosystems. So we will soon be launching a major initiative um, around uh, expanding sort of lessons learned and and um, peer to peer learning around um, DPI during the UN General Assembly uh, in September. Um, and we are also very proud and pleased to be working with ITU on Digital Day, which will be an event also on the margins of UN General Assembly Week to help advance um, the linkage between digital and SDGs for the UN community. And then finally, uh, UNDP is pleased to be co-chairing the UNGIS uh, this year, working closely with our UN agency colleagues to design and support an effective WSIS plus 20 review process. Uh, we start this work in earnest next week at UN headquarters in New York during the high-level political forum, at which we'll have one WSIS side event and co-sponsored by Peru and an UNGIS working group meeting. Um, and at IGF in October, there'll be a number of open forums and consultations. So we look forward to hearing everybody's views and suggestions for how to strengthen and improve with this in the years to come. Um, so I think I'd like to just conclude by saying UNDP is very committed to the IGF and the multi-stakeholder model that it represents, which the world needs now more than ever. So we look forward to seeing many of you in October. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, now we have Torbron Fredrickson from uh, Diplo. I'm Oh, yeah, I'm done. Uh, either Torbion, Li Ping, uh, i Going once. Um, if I can, can, can I join now? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Um, ah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Dmitry Belikhanov. I represent UNCTAD. Um, a significant hurdle for achieving inclusive digital growth is the slow diffusion of digital technologies. And at least for the last 20 years, uh, we've been observing the slow rate of technology adoption and use across countries, industrial sectors, and um, private companies. The limited spread of technological innovations is a major factor contributing to the overall slowdown in productivity and the uh, widening digital divides. At UNCTAD, we recognize that it's not just about having access to cutting edge technologies, but it's also about the capacity of countries and companies to build complementary skills and assets to benefit from technological investments. UNCTAD is deeply committed to facilitating the development of digital skills and research and development capabilities in developing nations to ensure they can have fully participate in the digital economy. I would like to take this opportunity to encourage you to read um, our flagship publications um, on the recent technological advancements, Technology and Innovation Report and Digital Economy Report. One of our most recent initiatives, Data for Development, showcases lessons and best practices from both developed and developing countries. Uh, the project highlights how these countries uh, have strengthened their abilities to leverage the data revolution. Data for Development initiative offers valuable insights into successful strategies for utilizing data for development, offering useful blueprints for other nations to follow. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, last, I think we have Serena Telmo from Diplo. Thank you, Chair. Hello again, everyone. Um, for those of you who might not know Diplo Foundation, we are a foundation um, that was founded more than 20 years ago by the governments of Malta and Switzerland, and we specialize in capacity development and research on digital technology and policy. We have a physical presence here in Geneva, also in Malta, Belgrade, and Washington, and we're looking into establishing this kind of a presence in Africa as well. I'm looking for partners there. On capacity development, we provide various courses and other programs on digital technology and policy. We have a network of over 7,000 alumni around the world, policymakers, private sector, civil society, um, academia, who have taken one or several of our courses. Um, we also operate the Geneva Internet Platform here in Geneva. Um, GIP is an initiative of Swiss authorities dedicated to facilitating inclusive digital policy debates in Geneva and beyond. And through both Diplo and the Geneva Internet Platform, one of our main goals is to support small and developing countries and also their actors um, to engage in global digital policy processes, be it the IGF, um, the Global Digital Compact, and everything else. And we do this through awareness raising and capacity development programs in various forms. And just to give you two examples, uh, in September, we're launching here in Geneva a series of briefings for African missions together with the mission of Kenya, basically trying to help them navigate through the complex digital policy ecosystem here and beyond. And just a few weeks ago, we delivered a training in New York for missions there um, around various digital policy topics, including IGF and the Global Digital Compact. We also run the Digital Watch, which is an observatory for um, digital policy, where we combine human expertise and artificial intelligence, trying to keep track of developments in the digital policy space, updates, actors, processes, um, everything else happening. So I do encourage you to take a look. Um, and part of the Digital Watch, we do reporting from major digital policy events. And one example is our um, reporting from the IGF. Uh, we try our best to report from um, as many sessions as possible there, but due to um, availability of resources, it might not be possible to cover everything. And I know um, there was this comment earlier today that we did not report from Dynamic Coalition. It's a matter of resources, but we're looking for uh, partners to support us in this um, endeavor and expand the, the coverage. Um, we also do research on specific digital policy issues, and two recent examples are a study on tech diplomacy and another study on African digital policy and digital foreign policy. And one last thing, we are running a humanism project exploring artificial intelligence from various perspectives, be it diplomacy, policy, language, arts, philosophy, and so on. And also part of this project, we have been experimenting with various artificial intelligence tools um, through our AI lab, basically developing um, artificial intelligence ourselves. 
And one of these tools is what we call um, DiploGPT, because, well, ChatGPT is quite famous these days, which is an AI system trained on our own work in the digital policy field for the past 20 years and also on various other um, digital policy resources. And we've tested it at um, United Nations Security Council a couple of um, weeks ago, a session led by Switzerland. It's available out there if you want to see uh, what AI produced as a session report. And as I said in the morning, we would be glad to explore together with the Secretariat and any other interested organizations how to use these and similar um, technologies in the IGF context, both in relation to upcoming annual meetings and to the wealth of knowledge that the IGF has produced over the years. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Thank now, you. now we have the, someone from the ITU. I'm not sure who. Frida? Uh, so my name is Pritam Malur, and I'm the head of the Emerging Technologies Division. So let me first convey uh, thanks for uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, talk to you. Uh, I'd already briefed you on ITU's efforts regarding the Business Plus 20 review and the GDC this morning. Uh, so I'll, I'll brief you on some other activities. Uh, obviously, we heard about the excellent preparations for this uh, year's IGF in Japan. And we look forward to continuing our uh, active engagement and collaboration this year. Uh, the ITU Secretary General is committed to joining you all there. And ITU, as always, will be organizing or co-organizing different sessions, including on Business Plus 20. Uh, I'll also take this opportunity to brief you on some activities that may of interest to uh, this meeting. Last week, we had the uh, AI for Good Summit. Uh, which concluded on Friday, uh, which had more than 40 UN agencies or bodies as partners convened by the government of Switzerland. Uh, the summit had productive discussions and a strong commitment to uh, find practical solutions, particularly on uh, global, global AI uh, frameworks. Uh, the participants also highlighted the invaluable expertise of International Geneva when it comes to complex uh, digital governance matters. Uh, this was actually the uh, you know one of the outcomes of uh, the uh, ambassadors roundtable that was chaired by the uh, Swiss ambassador. Uh, so uh, let me also highlight some other uh, developments at the summit. So ITU is uh, launching uh, sectoral efforts to assess AI readiness and drive innovation in critical sectors. We'll focus on health, smart mobility, and smart cities. And here we'll complement the work of UNESCO and UNDP uh, in this area as my colleague from UNDP just mentioned. Uh, in fact, uh, ITU co-chairs the interagency working group on AI with UNESCO, uh, again, with uh, more than 40 agencies as members. Uh, this comes under the chief executive board of the UN. So also at the summit, uh, ITU, WIPO, and WHO jointly established the global initiative on AI for health. Uh, this initiative aims to enable and implement health uh, AI globally. Uh, by focusing on uh, enabling policy and standards, by facilitating knowledge sharing and supporting evidence-based implementation to strengthen health systems. Uh, also, we had the first ever uh, press conference by robots uh, and also a diplomatic interaction between robots and ambassadors. Uh, and uh, uh, another activity which UNDP uh, already mentioned, ITU, UNDP, and partners from the UN system and beyond, we are convening the uh, uh, SDG Digital Day on 17th of September in New York. Uh, this uh, SDG Digital Day aims to put data and digital technologies front and center to catalyze greater action for all 17 SDGs, from eradicating poverty to reducing inequalities, to ensuring access to clean water and sanitation, and providing uh, affordable and uh, clean energy for everyone worldwide. So more information on all these initiatives are available on our website. Uh, we welcome all of you to contribute. Uh, I'll stop here now, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you again. We are very committed to the IGF process and uh, look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have someone from the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Hello. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Vinicius. I'm with the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGI.br, in Brazil. 
Um, good afternoon to everyone here in Geneva, and also good morning and evening for those participating online from the various countries and regions. Uh, as we have this very tight schedule, I'll, I'll, and also because it's the last session, um, I'll just briefly um, make some highlights um, about our activities. Um, to start, I'd like to mention that the Brazilian IGF was held between the end of May and the beginning of June, um, and that it was the first time we held a forum in a non-capital state, uh, in a non-capital city in Brazil. Um, it was a very good forum. A total of 1,400 people registered for the event. We had an outstanding number of on-site participants at the venue. During the four days of events, we had more than 600 people joining us in Uberlândia, a city in the state of Minas Gerais, southeast of the country. Uh, there, was also, there were also 400 online participants. We had a very good participation of all sectors and very fruitful discussions in general. Uh, all the videos are available and can be found in the website of our initiatives, forum.internet.cgi.br. Uh, I will post the address um, on the chat for the, rec the records. Um, in the beginning of July, we also held um, our Brazilian School of Internet Governance, gathering several professionals from all sectors in a sort of immersion experience with a wide range of discussions and activities for the whole week. I would also like to mention that the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee has been conducting a nationwide consultation on the regulation of digital platforms. The committee has been working, uh, working hard on this theme in the last years, and the consultation is a very important part of this process. It is an in-depth discussion dealing with the various issues under the broad umbrella term platform regulation, addressing themes such as content moderation, economic regulation, work conditions, sovereignty, and so on. By this time, we have around 400 participants registered, covering all sectors in all regions of Brazil. There are, there are almost 500 comments in our interactive platform. Um, CGI.br will consolidate and make available a set of reports from this process and will also build on these outputs to guide the debates and positions of the committee to contribute with the overall policy discussions. Um, to finalize, uh, as many others mentioned here in this final session, I would, like, I would also like to say that uh, CGI.br is very committed to the IGF. We have been actively participating in diverse processes related to the forum throughout the years. Uh, more recently, we have also submitted written inputs to the Global Digital Compact in which we strongly defend the Internet Governance Forum and its important role within the Internet Governance and Digital Ecosystem in broader terms. We will continue taking part and contributing to all the relevant processes under the IGF and remain available for all dialogues in this sense. That's it from my side. Um, thank you, Paul, and the Secretariat for the opportunity to talk about CGI.br. I am available to chat about these and other activities we have. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, Elisa from Netherlands. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, as we're almost coming to the end of this session, um, I thought this uh, session was intended to be a discussion, um, and uh, therefore I would also actually like to, to, well, I would really like to have a discussion, and not only updates from the organizations, even though they're very useful. Um, so this morning we had a good discussion about the IGF messages, and um, I would be interested to hear um, what you all think of the IGF messages and uh, whether they are useful for your organization and whether, they, whether you use them um, in preparing your own sessions, for example. And are the messages concise enough for you uh, or for your organization? And do you see any room for improvement of these messages? Um, or um, could these messages be drafted in a different way so they would be more beneficial to you? Um, I could imagine that all these questions are a bit too much for all of you to answer in person. So um, you, you can leave your comment in the, in the chat or, well, um, maybe give it back to the secretariat in, a, in another form. Um, because we are looking in ways to, to improve the messages um, and ensure that, it, that as many organizations as possible really use them. So, yeah, I, I hope you could take this back for um, your consideration. Thank you for the, the comment. Um, I think we can take a little time and it will 
just clear a little bit of the list here and we can take a little time to discuss your uh, initiative. First, uh, let's go to Michaela. Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you so much for your time and this opportunity to speak today. I'm here representing my organization, Global Partners Digital. For those of you who aren't familiar, we're a human rights organization based in London, UK, and we work to ensure that the voices of a diverse set of stakeholders are represented and heard. And this is something that we do to facilitate engagement across a number of forums in this space, but including and, and primarily in many ways, the IGF. Uh, Global Partners Digital as an organization is committed to the IGF and the multi-stakeholder model that it embodies and the important role it plays in bringing in the voices of diversity of stakeholders whose contributions would not necessarily be heard in other forums. We have a history of engaging with this forum. My colleague Chital Kumar has been, is one of the coordinators on the Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation. And we have been, and we submitted proposals for the IGF session coming up in Kyoto on a number of issues, including artificial intelligence and human rights and technical standards and human rights. We have also been actively engaged in the Global Digital Compact process, which we have been very actively engaged in terms of ensuring that there is a commitment to multi-stakeholderism in that process. And through that engagement, we're able to have a consultation with the co-facilitators, Rwanda and Sweden last week that others have mentioned today. And who we were keen to hear will be at the IGF in Kyoto. And this is an area where we'll continue to be working with the UN on ensuring that multi stakeholder perspectives are integrated. And we see, in response to the, the intervention that just came before, one of the elements that could be of interest is seeing how the IGF messages could be linked to the um, potential expansion of the IGF's mandate to reflect, to better reflect the reality of discussions that are broader than simply internet governance issues and expanding the understanding of internet governance to encompass all the issues that those of us who have participated in the IGS for a long time have seen that it encompasses more than just the basic internet governance architecture. Um, this is something that could help in terms of thinking about what could go into the IGF messages in terms of having more concrete suggestions, recommendations, language around how the work of the IGF fits into the wider work of the UN across its number of portfolios and across the different agencies that are working on these issues, including, for example, the OHCHR's work on technical standards and human rights, UNESCO's work on artificial intelligence, et cetera. So I'll stop there, but really just to say that the IGF is a forum that we are currently ex incredibly excited to be participating in, and we hope to see the expanded mandate as a potential option. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And uh, let's come back to Alisa. Uh, yeah. So, Lisa, if you want to state your your uh, objection or your your question, you can open up the floor for discussion on the topic. I I think I just already did that. <laughs> um. Yeah, so, so, so my main objective is to, to hear from other organizations what they think of the IGF messages, and Michaela already touched upon that, so not sure if it would be useful to restate what I just stated. Sorry. Yeah. That, that, that's okay. Is there anyone who wants to make your... Yes. Okay, I have just a short comment. Uh, I don't think we can, uh, uh, not all messages are uh, reflecting the sessions. Some of the messages are really, really good. Others, maybe not. I, what I would like to suggest is that we could have a, it would only be a short effort to have an assessment of the messages that we have got since we had the first one, and I think that was at Geneva uh, six or seven years ago uh, with the messages. Uh, and from that, we would not only gain uh, 
knowledge whether they were good or bad or useful, but we could get an overview how they evolved over these six, six to seven years, whether we had messages that came up every year, whether we had messages that developed further on uh, through the years. So I, I do think that would be maybe a small uh, workshop uh, effort, but, uh, but useful in regards of uh, deciding whether messages are useful or not. Thank you. And we can, sorry, we can also ask uh, the people who just presented, does anybody else want to respond to that question? I, Peter? Uh, no specific response, you know. Uh, I'm assuming this is regarding the messaging that you were talking about. Yes. Uh, we, we'd be happy to, you know, um, channel these messages uh, uh, that you produce, because I think, you know, we are all working towards the versus plus 20 efforts. So any common messaging or any messaging that we receive, we'll be glad to, uh, you know, um, socialize it among our constituencies also. Uh, and Anusha, no, I'm just picking on you, but if you have anything else to add. Um, no, but we look forward to sort of staying in touch and making sure those messages are aligned. So it's something we will definitely follow up on later today and tomorrow. Thank you for raising it. Oh, thanks. Um, then I'll just try finally, Tim. Um, thank you. From, from my side at the moment, there's uh, I, uh, nothing to contribute and to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of today's. Oh. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Amrita, for the record as, in, as a MAG member. I think um, there are three things. The messages, since IGF is so diverse, the discussions are diverse, and the messages which come out are diverse. Some messages may be suitable for some organizations or entities, others may not. Yes, an assessment helps, but it's very difficult because something may suit some organization, something may suit someone else. But perhaps a homework which we could think of, uh, you know, is before we have the IGF, perhaps send our messages to even uh, the organizations who perhaps have spoken now and get some feedback from them as to what would make it more relevant for them because we can't reach out to the whole universe. Uh, that's perhaps what we can do for our upcoming uh, IGF session. Chris and then Bruno. Um, I, I just also wanted to clarify. I mean, the, the messages for the last two years, I think, uh, are also published in draft form for feedback from the community going into the... So, I mean, I think there is... It's perhaps not a formal process of. Um, I'm not sure what a formal process would look like, and I, I'm a little wary at the idea of putting it out to other um, organisations who would also have their own um, agendas and perspectives. But I, I certainly think we we need to be working very hard to encourage people to use that feedback period to raise any concerns if they think that the messages are not reflecting. Um, the tenor of the discussion that was actually had at the event, which is really all they can all they can claim to do, um, and, and I hope that they're able to do that. Thanks. Rina? Just to clarify, I was just um, signaling that we had hands. I didn't mean to have my hand up. Um, I, have, I might have some few suggestions on better structuring of the messages. So first suggestion, um, all these messages can be assigned to different time horizons, whether they concern immediate impacts or long-term consequences, long-term trends. It's also maybe possible to indicate which organizations um, um, should be in charge, so to say, of, of certain messages whether it's United Nations family organizations or civil society or particular firms or firms or particular industrial sectors. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, may I? Yes, you may. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Were you no, first? Just I, I, I also have yours. See you and. Sorry. Okay. Uh, no, j just to to respond to Alyssa's question, um, I, I was waiting because I, I thought Shinji Tai was following the list. So because of it, <laughs> I didn't ask for the the word. Um, um, I I also have no particular answer in terms of uh, implementability or or what or about the the um, the actual use of the the messages in in, in real processes, but I I. Do, I, do, um, I do want to mention that uh, all the, the IGF processes and uh, the organization, the overall organization of the IGF, and, and especially the messages, more recently speaking, um, are processes and, and uh, um, details, aspects that we, for example, from our side organizing our national forum, uh, uh, all of these are things that we look to. We look to and I, um, we, we Examine that, and uh, we try to to um, to do something similar in our event, and also to be always um, as um, as close as possible to the organization, the overall organization of the IGF. So we have been doing that uh, since 2017, and we have been improving uh, year by year, um, year after year, and trying to be uh, more clo closer to to the uh, the processes um, done under the IGF. And the messages itself uh, are um, something that uh, we have been looking to as well um, in the, the, um, the last years. And we, we are also trying to do something similar in our forum, uh, but not implemented yet. So <laughs> I, I really don't, don't have how to, to analyze that from a, a point of view of uh, implementing something and analyzing the results of it. But uh, I do think they are important, very important in terms of conveying the messages from the IGF and conveying the results from the workshops mainly because of the participation of the community. So it's also some sort of uh, recognition of the, uh, of the participation of the members of the community in collaborating to the program. Um, but of course, I, I think there, there, there is always um, space for improvements and maybe, maybe some uh, um, um, dedicated improvement for, uh, for reaching some specific niches. Uh, trying to speak, for example, of policy spaces or, or um, legis less legislative spaces or, and so on. But uh, things to be discussed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have Tamea. Sorry, I was not sure if you said my name, Chair. Thank you. Um, sorry, I don't have a flag yet. I'll fix it by tomorrow. Um, uh, I said your name. <laughs> with the help of the Secretariat, I'm sure. So just to respond to your question, I thank you for that. I think that was, that was a really good question to, to all of us. Um, the high-level messages are, are, are that, right? They're supposed to be high-level, and, and it's very hard. I know how hard it is from being a past MAG member in really solidifying a week of very tough conversations and a lot that's going on at the IGF into a one-pager or two-pager of, of messages. So, so we have to give, keep that in mind when we think about the usefulness, so to speak, of the messages. But I think they're a very, very useful tool in signaling what the IGF has talked about, not just in a meeting, but throughout a year. I think that that is, that is the main priority of that, and, and I do commend colleagues uh, from the Swiss government who came up with this innovation uh, I don't know how many years ago when we had the IGF here, so thank you for that. Um, but I think what would make it even more impactful um, for organizations that are active in this space to go beyond a statement that might draw their attention, okay, yes, the IGF has done something about this particular issue that I'm interested about, is to know very easily where to find out more, figure out who could be partners, um, what has been said in more detail, what are the nuances of what has been said on a, on a topic. Uh, because the IGF is not there to certainly propose solutions. Uh, it's there to share information. Uh, it's there to share the various policy options that are, or various views that are around a certain topic. And it's very difficult to put into a message. So, so I think what would be useful for organizations like mine is to be able to find, um, after I've read the messages, 
a quick way um, somewhere on a website or, or be able to download a more detailed report on a certain topic. So if the IGF had eight teams, there should be eight messages, and under those eight messages, maybe eight or a multiple of eight links where somebody can find out more and find out who the partners could be to turn to um, to further their own activities. I think we need to think about the messages with the reports um, in a tandem. Thank you. And Chris, and then Adam. Okay. Go ahead. That's basically. Uh, thank you, Chair. I gave away my spot, but then the result is that <laughs> you're forgotten. But I, I forgive you after a long day. Um, I think that the questions that Elisa asked, she's asked in a few various forms all through the day. And I don't think that we've gotten a very satisfactory answer. And things improved because with, after when I put up my hand, I, we didn't get any response really on topic except that people said yes the igf is very important but why, what is this session for is that only for sending or is it for sending and receiving and i have the idea, idea is only for sending and perhaps that's a missed, opp missed opportunity for the future session like this uh, secondly i think that coming back to my comment of this morning of liaisons the mac members are re representing specific communities. So if you talk about liaisons, it would be quite natural for them to have a liaison role for three years for governments, for technical, for the industry, for academia, etc. Because then the messages will get spread into communities and they can ask for feedback. And then you get a diff probably a different sort of messages that may become actually more actionable for these communities. So that would be a suggestion to use the MAG members and their constituencies. And who knows what can come from it. Thank you. We want to clear it the last two. That's it. That's it. We asked Adam, he said no. Okay. No hands, good, setting an opportune time to close the meeting for today. I'm not even gonna begin to try to uh, sum up today's meeting other than that it was a, a lot of data crossing a lot of uh, areas of activity with a lot of potential and a lot of work that have gone into putting this meeting together. And the meeting itself has been somewhat innovative with uh, the way we just ran the, the sessions this afternoon. But I hope, um, what you've had today you give you something to think about overnight and be able to come and participate fully tomorrow in the morning. And with that, unless there's anyone who demands a final word, the meeting is adjourned. Nobody demanded a final word. Yeah. Mm -hmm.